G'day, I'm James, and I'm a hobbyist maker. I live in Sydney, Australia, beautiful place. This is my workshop. Hang on a second. This is my workshop. It ain't much, but I started from a blank canvas of absolutely nothing in this garage, and over the past four years, it's become my happy place. I've only got two rules here. Everything needs a home, and everything has to pay for itself. And what I want to do today is take you all on a journey. I'm going to share with you every single development that has occurred in this workshop over the past four to five years from go to woe, so you can see what it takes to turn an empty one-car garage into a fully functioning woodworking workshop that can still have a car parked in it. So sit back, relax, get the popcorn, and settle in because the first videos are a little bit rough. Don't worry, my editing, along with my woodworking skill, improves as we go along. Because the beauty of all this is, while I was building my workshop, I was building my hobby. Before starting this undertaking, I had basically never touched a power tool before, and fortunately, I recorded pretty much the whole journey right here on YouTube, and that's what I want to share with you guys today. I'll chime in from time to time with a bit of classic commentary, because some of the things that I look back on now were, um, shall we say, not the best. But for the most part, I'm really proud of this video, and I hope you enjoy it too. So let's jump in the time machine all the way back to 2019 and my first ever workshop project. Cabinets. G'day everyone, welcome back to Fix It Fingers Workshop and take a good look at the wall behind me because over the coming weeks and months, this whole area, what I've used as my workshop for the past 10 months, is getting basically a complete redesign. I was very fortunate a couple of months ago off Facebook Marketplace, I managed to scab a whole bunch of plywood for completely free. And I've just worked out on my cutting list that I've got just enough here to do this project providing I don't bugger anything up. So we can see back then things were pretty rough. No uniform, no camera, no lights, no microphone, and definitely no table saw. That wouldn't come for years. That's much better. Lovely. And I do lie, this wasn't the first project. That pegboard was, but honestly, I wouldn't make anyone sit through that. Right, so there is my first set of two. They are now exactly the same size, which is what I wanted. Fantastic, who needs a table saw? You could just butt joint these together, of course. You could use the Craig jig, and I am gonna do that, and that would probably be the easiest, fastest way. But on top of doing the pocket holes, I'm also gonna do some rebates in the tops and bottoms of the panels so that I get some more glue in area and you get maximum strength. Why engineer something when you can over-engineer something? Rebates and pocket holes. Yeah, still, still to this day, don't know what the hell I was thinking there. Now you can see the point of these dados is not only are they going to add strength and gluing area, as I dry fit it here, they should keep the whole thing nice and square too, which again is going to make life easier. Which is true, it's the whole point of dados and rebate construction, but you can kind of skip the pocket holes if you do that.
time to make the French cleats, which I'm going to use to hold these things up onto the wall. They're not going to have a back on the cabinet, literally just the cleat along the top there. They're not perfectly even, I could have measured up my line a bit better. But that's a pretty chunky cleat. Look at that. Time to work on the doors before I can uh, get them mounted up on the wall. This is 18mm MDF, which I cut up at the car park at Bunnings with the rip cut. I'm not putting handles on the doors of the cupboards. Instead, I'm gonna have a giant chamfer all the way on the side and then just bounce it up for decorative purposes, another one along the top. What this build did do was really set the tone, accidentally, of what my workshop style would look like. While I came up with this design on the fly, it pretty much dictated how I would then go about designing every other project that you're gonna see in this view. Time for this mess to go away. Do it the easy way, shall we? That'll do for now. Wow, check out the fancy editing on that. Seamless. That ain't going anywhere. Let's try a test now. This is a light. Oh, mate, that's a win. Excellent, one of them done. Looks like navy blue is gonna end up being the workshop color. Because I don't like buying paint, this is the leftover from the toy box I made a few months back. My love for chamfers, workshop blue, pocket holes, rebates and dado construction. These will be the themes that I continue to carry through to today. Right, that's back on. Moment of truth. Let's see if this actually works. I've never put two doors on before. Yes! Excellent. Just to prove these can take some weight. Well, there you have it. The first stage of my workshop redevelopment is complete, and I'm pretty bloody chuffed to be honest. First time I've done cabinets, and they've come out pretty well. I've learned an awful lot through this design, and I'm just so happy that it's come up the way that it has, and it looks exactly like I did it on SketchUp all those months ago. So, simple and humble beginnings. Next up, we get a bit more complicated. Time for part two of the workshop makeover. This shelf is the next one to go as we put some shallower, more accessible shelving here for the things that I use every day. Again, like last time, I am going to attempt to use up the last of my scabbed plywood and MDF scraps and offcuts. This can again be done with one sheet of 17 mil, plus some MDF, quite a bit of MDF to be honest. So this was a real theme of most of my early projects, using a circular saw with jigs to navigate not owning a table saw. Honestly, I fell in love with the Craig brand pretty early thanks to Woodworking for Mere Mortals, and their series of jigs got me through years of having woodworking.
Well, that's the main part of my cutting done, and again, no table saw needed. Not as fast, I suppose, but square cut, rip cut, and look at these. All exactly the same size. Dado time. The only ones you really have to cut for this project are the ones that are going to hold the stationary shelf, which forms the top of the drawer. I am, like I did on the last project, going to do the ones on the sides and the ones in the middle for the walls. That's to help keep things nice and square and to help me with my gluing up stage. Still don't have my good bit back from my mate who I lent it to, so I've gone to my old crappy one. It's going to smoke harder than a bogan doing circle work, but it should get through them. Just going to look a little bit dramatic. Yep, that was a cheap old bit, but I often wonder if people outside of Australia oh, understand Molly. what the hell I'm saying sometimes. Bogan equals redneck. Circle work means destroying your tires. Not gonna lie, pretty bloody chuffed right now. I'm trying something different with the cleats this time. I'm gonna remove a part of the center dividers for each of the new shells so that the cleat will stick in it like that and I'll just be able to hang it on the wall. I hope. had to make a quick bike ride out to the post office. Because this just arrived. I won their first competition. It was a K5 master set. So it's not just paid jigs I'm a fan of. In this build we've seen my ripping jig, my inverted jigsaw, and my DIY jointer. I built a lot of tools early on. Because when you're really low on space and budget, flipping a standard power tool upside down opens a world of possibilities. You can bring the material to the tool instead of the tool to the material. That was such a good fit. Barely needed the glue at all. More free bed slats scabbed off the side of the road, and just like last time, I'm cutting a little bit more off the bit that's going to be on the wall compared to one that's going to fit snugly into the units so that when I hang them up, I've got a bit of play to shift them backwards inside. the jack that I've stolen out of the back of my car and I'm hoping this works. Beautiful. Another reoccurring theme of the Fix Your Fingers workshop is brick. 
brick, 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 and more bloody brick. One of my best videos is actually about drilling bricks, because I got a lot of experience. Last stage for this build is just some quick floating shelves, of course, but then most importantly, the newest part, the drawers. This is how it's going to go together, upside down of course, so you can see that rebate where drawer bottom is going to sit. Trying to hold that together. Uh oh. Ah, oh, snug as. That's not bad for a first attempt. And hopefully, if I've trimmed this up just right, That will be a lovely snug fit. And this here is the power of YouTube. Yes, watching woodworking videos is fun. I hope you're enjoying this. But yeah, I had never made drawers before and these came out pretty much perfect just from watching other talented people do this work before me. I'm gonna put a little bit of routed profile just like these. I'm going to have a chamfer under there and that's how the drawers are going to operate and similar with this little top strip it's going up there decorative chamfer measure it up snip it off at the right spot give it a few coats of paint So I need to line it up to this corner here. Now I'm hoping that double-sided tape will grab. Test fit, see how this goes. And a final little embellishment. Just a bit of trim for the front. Well, there we go. Stages one and two of the workshop reno are now complete. And so with the general storage out of the way, it was time to get a little more clamp spiffic. This is my clamp collection, because where I'm gonna build my clamp rack is in this little void, which I left when I designed my cupboards. All going to be made out of scrap plywood. Let's try and get some of these clamps up and out of the way and improve the efficiency of this workshop a little bit more. I say scrap, but what I often mean by that is scavenged. This is some 16mm plywood that I scabbed off the side of the road earlier this week, which will make up the backing board that I'm going to screw all these small clamp attachments to. Rip cut, making short work of it as usual. And yes, this video is going to be an awful lot of 10 inch Bosch Axial Glide Mitosaur. First project I'm using it. Again, just making things up as I go along. I'm trying to keep my fingers away from the blade and use various clamping techniques so that everything is held down nice and still. 300 millimeter cut capacity on that, so I can go up to 600 doing a double cut, such as you just saw there. As this is scrap wood, I did have to sand it back. She was pretty dirty and mucky. Really simple construction for this backing board. I didn't want to drill it directly into the brick wall. I wanted it a little bit away. So just cut down quickly some spaces, 
many screw holes to secure the spacer to the backing board and then a few larger holes to put into the bricks. So there's my backing board and that would just allow me to space out the smaller clamp modules as I'll call them anywhere I need them to be. So the first module is going to be for these bar clamps. They're the urban quick release type and my wide ones were 32.5 millimeters. So that's the spacing I needed to work on. Here's more of that 12 mil plywood that I am laminating together to give it the extra strength that it needs. Little spacer block just to make sure that the gaps are gonna be correct. And they're about six-ish mils for the bars to slot into. Again, you'll have to measure your own. Lovely thing about workshop projects, nothing has to be millimeter perfect. So I could just glue up the two boards, wait for them to dry, and then use a flush trim route a bit to pretty it all up. Might be a workshop project, but we don't need to be uncouth about these things. This style is also going to be handy for F clamps and other bar style clamps too. You just have to measure them up carefully. Now I did try to cut these with the router, but you can probably notice a little burning there. That didn't work too well, wasn't a very clever idea. Far too much work for a five mil router bit to do. So I went back to the jigsaw table, drilled out the ends and then simply cut the slits in. I was being a bit paranoid with the spacing, but honestly, it doesn't matter that much. As long as they fit the clamps in, everything is all good. Just cleaning out the slots with a file. And then to get the clamps in easier, just taking the corners off the entry ports so that they will self-locate when you're in a bit of a hurry. Final sand and test fit. And the main support for the bar clamps is pretty much done. Now I can fit nine in here. That was purely based on the space that I had available in between the cabinets. I didn't want to create too much extra space because then I'd just go and buy more clamps, but I have got a few spare slots on there. And they all fit in quite nice. Drill, glue and screw the backing board to the clamp rack holder. All simple butt joints here, it doesn't need to be more complicated than that. I also had some square scrap lying around and I decided to add a few small braces. There she is, all done just needs to be attached to the wall. So as we saw before, those Craig C type sort of clamps about that. And I do have some other similar style clamps and manufacture a dowel hanger effectively. Backing board, couple of side plates. Ooh, getting to use the mitre function for the first time and try out a few different things. Now this was gonna be a small cut. So I put a zero clearance fence clamped in there. And then I can use a stick to hold down my smaller pieces of wood and cut the 45 angle. And that worked very, very well. And a lovely shot of my arm at the same time. Recycling my dowel as well. This was an old broom handle that I keep around for just this thing. And now it's time to break the second woodworking for me immortals golden rule, which is of course, never film yourself sanding a dowel. I don't know why Steve said that. Look at all that lovely sawdust coming off. I'm all masked up, it's perfectly safe. What's possibly wrong with filming yourself sanding a dowel? In slow motion, it's beautiful. Oh yeah, look at that, pretty sawdust. And hell, it works. I need to get that down to 20 mils, which was the size of my force and a bit that I was going to drill into, well, halfway through those little side panels. I used a larger force and a bit to space it accurately from the edge. And then went down, yeah, just about halfway, roughly that. So the way I put this together was just to attach one side, then to dry fit it together with my freshly sanded dowel. Yeah, it's a little bit more sanding, give it a tweak, make sure it fits in there comfortably. Smack it with a hammer. A few minor adjustments, I cut that dowel a little bit long and I could trim it down until it was the perfect fit. Then we could glue it all together 
And my C-style clamp rack is the second part complete. That's strong. To attach it, I used the five screw method. I just came up with that, but it sounds impressive, doesn't it? Put a screw in the middle so that you can tweak it one way or the other with a level, and then screw the other four into the corners. Might be able to squeeze one or two more in there as well, but it's looking good. Now, I didn't even bother filming all of this. The final little clamp attachment for that backing board is just for some pinch clamps and my very small quick grip clamps. The only difference of this really is simple butt joints, simple braces, and a 12 mil board up top instead of the 16. It was just a better fit for the quick grips. The best thing about that large backing board on the wall is I could carefully space everything out and if I ever needed to move it, I'd be able to. Having broken golden rule number two, I thought, why the hell not? Let's just go ahead and break the golden woodworking for mere mortals rule. And here we have a perfectly lovely sided board put against the wall with the crappy side showing. Sorry, Steve. In the meantime, I've just gotten some email advice from YouTube saying that my video is at risk of being banned, so we've had to take some precautionary measures for the last little clamp attachment. No idea why. Anyway, my little knob is safe, so I'm just going to bash it with a hammer. Feels good. And attach it to the wall for my band clamp. I remember one time in band clamp. Wait, that's a different story. Stocked up and ready to go. It's not all about storage. This was the first stationary tool I added. Don't be afraid to buy secondhand quality branded tools. I got my new miter saw, secondhand, a few months ago now, and I'm in love with this machine. And I want to make a proper miter station to solve a few different problems. This handle just touches here. I want to bring the body of the miter saw in line with the tabletop so I can put a running stop block solution on here too. Keeping in mind also that underneath I have the guinea pig's hay box and I want to keep that front open so that the box can be used as it is. And I've got about 50 centimeters extra on the far side of the bench before it makes contact with the opening mechanism of the garage door. So I'm going to put a cantilevered drawer out there too. And if that doesn't sound complicated enough, I want to make this entirely, and I mean entirely, out of half laps. I have no idea how many there are going to be. We'll count as we go along. No, this is not a sane way of doing things. Yes, it's going to be incredibly hectic. We're going to do this purely for the sheer joy, we'll call it, of the exercise. Testing my precision, testing my patience, and just because, why the hell not? The last consideration I'm going to make is I have been scabbing over the past few months many, many, many bed slats of various types and styles. So they are what I'm going to use for the vast majority of the construction of this bench. So it really shouldn't cost me very much. Over ambitious? Yes. Completely rubbish? Possibly. Let's see how it turns out. All right, the half lap counter is in your top left set to zero. And the first thing I had to do was build an extension fence so I would be able to make some repeatable cuts on the miter saw, which is going to do the vast majority of the work in this project, which seemed appropriate. I thought I would start off with an error, as I've done on several videos, and here you'll see me marking out the wrong measurement. These ended up 89 millimeters shorter than they needed to be. They are the legs, and I'm not entirely sure how I managed to get to that number, but we did, and everything you see me doing here, I basically had to redo all over again, after a quick Timmy Tam break. Wifey brought me down some hot chocolate, and this is how you do a proper Tim Tam slam. Bite off the corners of a double coat Tim Tam, suck the hot hot chocolate or coffee through, and then shove the whole thing in your gob. Tasty. Welcome to Australia. Back on the Midasaur. Chop, chop, chop with the stop block gives me four legs of the wrong height, but at least they are even. I'm not going to show you every cut in this build or every mark out. I'm just going to basically put it out there once and you can see hopefully how I sped up, got more efficient as we go along and I figured out different ways of cutting the half laps. Once the legs were cut, the next thing was to do the braces and make these into some leg assemblies. Marking out every piece is very important and here you can see what I meant about the efficiency. 
I didn't have to measure too many of these half laps. I could just use off cuts of wood to mark out the correct widths for pretty much everything. And here's how we're going to do it with the trenching. This is a depth stop. Most miter saws, sliding miter saws that is, will have one. And this little knob here adjusts the height. So I got a 17.5 mil scrap, which I would use as my clearance. My board's at 35 mil, so that's going to get me about through. And I made sure that that fit all the way under. So I'm cutting about 17 mils. You'll quickly learn when trenching, however, that the depth stop stops you getting all the way to the end of the board, as you can see here. So the solution is to put a sacrificial fence in, zero clearance, chop it through, and that will give your blade the extra space that it needs so that the lowest point of the blade will cut cleanly all the way through. Here was my first trench, and yes, it is as much work as it looks like, and I had a bazillion of these things to cut. Hammer is used to clear out the waste, and it was around this point with my first attempt at using the chisel to clean up the half lap that I realized that was not going to cut it. Well, it would, but I don't have the patience for that, so we'd have to come up with a more overcomplicated way of doing this. There was also a bit of a technique to the trenching, got better as I went along. They were probably a bit thin there, I didn't have to quite cut them out that thin, but it was very therapeutic to belt the crap out of them with a hammer. With a test fit, if it wasn't working, you could sneak up on it very, very carefully by pushing the piece against the blade to flex it, and then you'd be able to knock off a hair until you got a lovely fit. Taking out the guts of this one so that the braces would fit in the middle there. And that was the ugly mess that I was left with after my trenching. So I pulled out the router sled and a couple at a time, I could get my lovely servicing bit from Adam's Bits. Do recommend his service there. 22 mil on this one. And not only was it going to be nice and clean, but with the plunge router, I could very, very accurately set the depth so that when the half lats finally came together, they would be true half laps. And there's my first result. Don't they look pretty? Here's the test fit. And this is a rough and ready project, but I was pretty damn chuffed with how well that they came out. So again, I'm not gonna show you every single joint, but this technique was used for all the big flat 90 mil half maps. And here are the first joints going together. Eight of them bump up that counter. No glue here. This is a workshop workbench, and so it will just be screws holding these. The strength is gonna come from the joinery. The screws are just acting as the fasteners that they are. Two leg assemblies knocked over. On to my long rear rails. And there was just a bit of creativity here. Effectively, I put the pieces together, mark out what needed to be removed as waste, and then hack at it any way I can, including once and only once in this instance with the jigsaw. Here's a little bit of an experiment. It kind of worked, but it wasn't the best way of doing things. So after this attempt, nice tight fit. Look at that, lovely. I put the jigsaw away and return to the router. Here again, cleaning up to the exact correct depth with the plunge was very, very effective. Clamping a few bits together at the same time saved heaps of time as well, but I couldn't avoid a little bit of chisel work just to tidy up the edges. Another pretty spinning diagram. Here are my long cuts on the straightest bits that I could find, and that is why I'm building Mita Station. Marking out where these will go into the leg assemblies. And the middle brace, which will come between those two back rails just after they're installed. However, I ran into a problem here. Straight away, I could not, on the long edge, trench on the miter saw. So instead, it was the Craig square cut and the circular saw set to the correct depth in order to get these short edge, I should say, cutouts. And here you can also see it works basically the same way. Smack out the chips, clean it up, and that is 12 half laps already done. So you can see I'd already done the mortises. I could fit in the next piece for that vertical brace, mark it off, clean it out, and we're starting to get a bit of stability to the workbench.
bang up the 14. Now the longest piece was going to be the front rail and this is also, while not a bed slat, a reclaimed piece of bed but it did have a bit of lacquer on there which I didn't like so it was over to the DIY jointer. I'll put a link up the corner if you want to see how to build yourself one of these out of a 3 inch planer. And I was just taking the varnish off. The only fool's errand I had here was that I'd actually already measured and cut one of the mortises and it fit really snug. And then I planed off the varnish. Here you can see where that pre-cut mortise caused me problems. I needed a shim, lucky there are lots of those little biscuit things lying around that I'd knocked out of the joints. And I was able to level up and tighten this joint up, which was now too wide. Front rail being installed, use some really big ass screws on this, so I needed to extend my pilot holes through into the frame, and the shim would hold everything nice and level. And now it's time to check in with Dana Designs. There you go, Mark. That's not how you check square. That's how you check square. Check square, check square, check square, check square, check square. TM. All right, stop in a dickhead. They do go check out Mark's channel. He's an awesome bloke. Check square. Speaking of Dana Designs, AKA the Pallet Punter, uh, if you go watch his method of cutting half laps, it is much more logical and sane, where he uses his table saw and band saw to make two cuts and gets things done a hell of a lot faster. I still have no regrets about selling the bandsaw. I still have no regrets selling the bandsaw. I'm still not regretting. Sadly, I have neither of those tools, but I did manage to, on some of these cuts, work out how to do it with the circular saw, and it is vastly superior to trenching. And it was about this point that I realized I'd built the world's worst hammock, and it was time for a nap. Now how the f do I get out? I so thought I was gonna get stuck in there. Here's a nice example of that two cut method. I could clamp these bits all together for the vertical draw rises and bang, 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 out they go. And we are up to two dozen half laps as we install the draw rises into the main frame and check level. Quick as you like, they're exactly the same as the earlier ones. We got the braces on there and it was time to do our first test fit. Away with you old shoddy made bench. Here we go, let's fit the new shoddy made bench. Now this was, from an engineering point of view, the trickiest part of the build. I didn't want an extra leg, as you might have noticed that my dust cart lives underneath this new bench. So I needed a cantilever solution to get a draw and also to extend my work surface. So I had kept some of the frame unattached in order to allow me to fit in this back piece. It was going to have three connections, which I've cut off camera here. And importantly, that little notch you can see on the side will actually have the miter saw sitting on top of it on its MDF base, right here. So the miter saw's weight will be bearing down all 32 kilos of it, including the MDF on that, onto that little peg and should stop that draw from being able to lift up regardless of how much weight I put on there. This was a bit of a tricky fitting together exercise but it did bump us over the magic 30 number of half laps cut. Up goes the wheelbarrow and another counter bore underneath to hold that cantilever nice and strong. She was getting a bit of weight in her by this stage. I was pretty impressed with this fit actually. It was nice and snug. And just like before, we cut another quick brace, clean that out with the router too, and we're nearly there. These are still bed slats, they're just a little bit thinner, only 19 mil, the rest of the stock had been 90 by 35, and I found out another way to cut half laps, this time using the plunge router. A few little supports clamped on there and it made quick work of the 10 half laps for these draw tops to fit over. A 
I cut the other side on the router table in two passes, getting about half of the waste out the first pass and half on the second. The fence made it really easy and clamping two of them together meant I could cut them pretty safely with a push block. Didn't take very long at all. In fact, the only really tricky bit of this was for the cantilevered section because it needed a mortise right in the middle and that was a little bit trickier to measure and line up. But again, on the router table in two passes, I was able to do that quite effectively. These will be the last bits of wood and the last half laps that I need to count. A few taparoos, screw them down and my frame is nearing completion. Join me next week as I put in the drawers, the work tops, and the sliding stop block. Not gonna be a fence on this one to finish the project off, but I hope you enjoyed this little bit of madness, and I would highly recommend never trying to do this so there will not be any plans. If you wanna be a nutbag like me, you can make it up as you go along too. So pulling out the rip cut and we're going to start with the tops. This will be a fairly long video but I've broken it down hopefully into some logical sequences. This is an old kitchen counter which I am slicing and dicing to fit the three surfaces. That was the easy one, it was square. These ones got trickier, having to cut off the round kitchen top sections. And then doing a stop cut using my guide here to accommodate the brick pillar in the wall. Little Rioba, just cleaning up the end of that. And then the other side of my track can be used for my jigsaw to help keep it in a straight line. So that countertop will fit in there. Nice scribing. Now we're back to more bed slats. Couldn't continue the project without them. These little bits of trim are cut on my ripping jig. and then use the miter saw out of 45 to fake up some edge banding. Glue and nails time. The glue was quite easy. However, when I started to think about the nailing options, this was just looking really, really messy. Didn't have the right nails, couldn't figure out how I was gonna do it easily, so time for some magic. If I get all my hammers, and a battery, bit of electrical tape, put them all together, then I wish really, really, really hard upon a star, what can we make happen? Oh yeah, boys, new tool day. This is the 1535DZN Makita Nailer, which I wanted for my birthday, and luckily wifey watches my videos, so I got one. This is literally the first time that I've pulled it out, and there is, like any tool, a bit of learning to go on here. I was a bit tentative with it to start with, and I'm using the soft nose cone, which I quickly got rid of, but this is an absolute game changer. Nothing I couldn't already do, but I can now do it 10 times faster. It did cause me a few problems down the line, but we'll deal with those later. Sanding edge banding, don't forget to go through the really thin veneer on top and make a mess of it. There were learning experiences with the nail gun, shall we say. And a few minor stuff ups with the miters, but nothing we couldn't just uh, slide in and fix. Soon though, I was powering along with my new toy. Edge banding was on and the tops were done, but not attached. Now for something else new, drawers, draw slides in particular. Three drawers for this build. And again, delving into the scrap pile, searching for 12 mil plywood that I'd use to make up the boxes. Edge guide on the ripping jig, made sure that all of the draw pieces would be the same height. Makes really quick work. Still don't need that table saw. Chopping all the draw sides to the same length. 
Rebate construction for these drawers. Clamping two of them together not only makes sure that the rebates are exactly the same on both side of these drawer front and backs, but makes it a lot safer too and gives you something to hold on the clamp. Then a six millimeter bit in there, quarter inch, in order to make a groove or a dado there for six millimeter MDF, which will form the base of the drawers. Looks good. I can use the band clamp to tighten it all up. Do the Townsville shuffle, checking square. Then pull out the brad nailer and pop a few brads in instead of having to wait for that glue to dry. This saved so much time. I've watched enough YouTube videos of this. Hopefully it goes smooth enough. So first you hit this little toggle on the side to remove the part that will stick to the drawer. Clamp it down, drill some holes using the level to keep it nice and straight and screw it in. Bang, 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 bang. Super fast forward to have another drawer and this one fit very nicely. Then it's a simple matter of finding the holes, popping in some screws, pulling it out, repeating that step. Once two screws are in, you can pull out the whole drawer and finish off the job. Right, so next up, I'm gonna to have to attach these tops. And to be honest, I didn't really think this through to begin with, but the solution I've come up with is gonna be pocket holes. So the first ones were along the back wall, so I could do this on the outside, which just made my life a little bit easier. The clamping block worked really well. Then I had to get a bit more creative to access the inside, so I didn't have those pocket holes showing quite as much. Luckily all this climbing around kept me warm, been bloody chilly here in Sydney recently if the beanie and thermal didn't give it away. Bang in some of the Craig screws. Hold that workbench down. And in a few places, I didn't need to use pocket hole screws. I could access the little drawer tops there and just use some regular screws to finish the effect. Bit of weight in the bench now with those heavy MDF tops on, but at least it's looking like a workbench. And finally lifting the beast into its home position. Really nice snug fit here. I needed a little shim here just to get the miter saw up to the correct height. So it's just a fraction of a millimeter above the bench top. So the wood would sit nice on there. Then drill a few holes through and bolt it down nice and securely. The next step is the reason for having a miter saw station, and that is the T-track and stop block. Here is a trick that I got off Dave Stanton for setting the correct depth when routing out something like T-track. Zero off your bit, turn it around, shove the T-track in, and set the stop on the T-track. Then when you lock it all down, you'll be at the exact correct depth. I did this in two passes using the T-Track clamp down as my straight edge and then had to actually switch out the base to the trim base in order to get all the way to the edge here. You notice I'm not going to have a fence. I am just literally going to use the T-Track and stop block and use the short fence on the miter station. Just in front of the groove for my T-Track, I routed a millimeter thin pass on the router for the tape, which will get stuck down there. Now this is cheap T-Track, so it didn't have any holes in it. I had to drill those myself and then use an eight millimeter drill bit to countersink those as well. No glue, just a few screws. And my bolts now slide nicely through there. Exactly where my zero was on the left hand side didn't matter. You'll see why very shortly. Another quick addition, because I really like it, is a zero clearance fence, but I'm not going to explain it because I literally stole it directly off Paul the Wood Knight. So if you want to see how to make this, then go over to his channel. I'll throw the link up. 
Main feature you'll notice there is apart from being zero clearance, there's that lovely little chamfer to stop the dust from building up underneath. This stop block, however, was of my design. Mine is going to be made out of recycled fence palings. That is some Merbau, and it's going to have a clear window in it, which I will be able to line to the zero of the tape I've just stuck down. So a bit of super glue will hold that together. The two pieces give me basically a zero thickness line, so I should be able to make it nice and accurate. Used a force and a bit to create that window and then just grab the router to create the rebate for the Perspex to sit in. To allow a bit more light and make it easier to read, a giant cove bit made that pretty little detail. And I have two separate positions in which the T-bolt can go for either close-up or long-distance work. Cutting it down to length also gave me another scrap which I could combine with an off-cut of Tassie Oak to triple up the actual stop block end of it. And because my joins were rubbish, I put a V-bit in the router and made a couple of nice little details. Thanks Cuffy, good tip there. Bit of super glue now I can whack in the window. Then using a bonus sticker from up north, I could set the depth on my miter saw to clean up the back of the stop block, just so it looked a little bit prettier. And I put a little toe on the far end to make it easier to slide just with a few millimeters of clearance above the T-track. Now here's how it works. I do have some star knobs coming uh, in the mail very soon, so I had to use this crappy furniture bolt for the moment. For the first cut, I slide my new block and lock it in at exactly the zero marker in the window and chop. Therefore, anything that I push up against the block now in the future will be zero at that exact point. Not that I'll be cutting anything with zero length, at least I don't think so. But we thought we'll do a test. So we set it 10 centimeters or 100 millimeters, whack a test piece in there, give it the chop down, pull out the calipers and see how we went. And that was 100.3 millimeters. I will take that. Single coat of Danish oil makes the colors pop. And that's a damn pretty little stop block. Moving along, and it's time to make the draw fronts, last major stage. But my old straight edge has seen better days. However, the magic worked before, let's try it again. Boom! One Craig AccuCut. That little guide served me very well, but this is just a leaps and bounds ahead. That little peg that I've just installed is to help me get some more stability when using bearing bits. Now, honestly, I probably should have just used my fence as these draw fronts are straight and I could have done the chamfer controlling the dust a bit better using my split fence. But for curved bits and future work where the fence is impractical, that little pin in the table is going to add some safety. You'll see the top 45 just stops the dust collecting on the draw fronts. The bottom 45 acts as the finger pull, so I can reach underneath and I don't need hardware. Quickly clamping to the draw fronts allows me to put the screws in position before I remove them again for painting. And we are getting very close to the end of this build. You also notice I do some little cutaways there to make the draw fronts sit nice and pretty over the edge of the main table. Drawers, of course, get some undercoat to seal the MDF and then a bit of workshop blue over the top. While the paint's drying, another new tool. Jeez, I shouldn't tell wifey how much money I've been spending recently. But these Sutton bits I got from Total Tools and they are my first hole saws and they are absolutely brilliant so far, even though I've only asked them to cut through MDF. That plug hole there is going to be for my vacuum. Sliding up from underneath, no, the dust collection on this thing isn't brilliant, but it is certainly better than nothing. Lovely. Next, I reckon this is the single most important thing you can add to your workshop. Light. Right, so here's the current situation. At the moment, I've got the light on top of my tripod at my face. I've got my garage door open to the natural light, which is the main source of illumination for the Fix It Fingers workshop. I have a single 100 watt LED bulb, and that's it. 
filming and making is really difficult in such a dark workshop. And so today, we're going to sort that problem out. Right, so this will be terrible because I'm recording on the front camera of my phone, but just to go along with the lux meter that you can see, we started here at the back of the workshop where I've got all the wood storage and so on. Then as we see that lux meter climb, that's because we're coming underneath directly the existing bulb. Then it drops right off again as we come out to where I do most of my work really because I'm going to get the natural light coming in from over here, but it's still quite dark, particularly once the sun goes down. And then you'll see it skyrocket as my light balances to come out here, but it's usually too windy and a bit noisy for the neighbors. And then we do the reverse process where I have walked it back in through, drops off under the light bulb, picks up, I get shadows. I didn't actually come all the way over to my workbench area, but it's not much better to be honest. And we finish that lux meter right about here in the back of the workshop again. We'll compare that after we've got the four new lights up to see how it went. Effectively, I'm envisaging a box with a rebate around it, which I can slide these light panels into. Each of them are 1.2 meters long. They're about 36 watts and at 4,000 Kelvin. Cool white light, because that's better for filming in my little situation here. Right, first step is getting this 12 mil or half inch ply that I scabbed from a building site into some form of square. Breaking out the new AccuCut and it did the first two bits perfectly. Got myself a nice straight edge and then measured out the length of the long sides and decided to test how accurate the right angle ability of it is and it was damn near perfect. Now I had some clean edges, we could get out the rip cut. So that quick little changeover, now I'm at my cutting width for the height of the boxes. These are the long sides obviously. And while it may not be as quick as the table saw, it certainly beats not having anything at all. Look at that. You're talking under 0.1 of a millimeter accuracy there if you take your time and you be careful. Eight long sections were needed for the four boxes. Yeah, this old construction ply is a bit bendy. We'll have to figure out something to force it into the correct straightness. But then again, these boxes will be on the ceiling. No one's gonna look that closely anyway. Same story, 80 millimeter high, three and a quarter inch. Could cut up my short sides, then over to the miter saw to chop them down to the correct length. Here's yet another trick that I stole off Dave Stanton's channel. I saw him do this a little while ago where he's put a hole in the side of his router table just past the plate. And if you can guess what it's for, we're about to cut some dados and dados are notorious for filling up with dust, which is not fantastic. So that positioned hole allows the vacuum to be installed and it's even holds down the wood pretty well. and look at those lovely clean dados you get. It doesn't capture all of the dust, I still get a bit shooting past there. It is fun to watch in slightly slow motion though as the dust gets sucked in as the wood passes over the vacuum port. But the important thing is that it doesn't get stuck in there, doesn't burn, and it does make a bit less mess. We ran the long pieces through the same way and then we moved the fence to cut some rebates. These things are basically giant drawers, 1.2 meter long drawers where the base is gonna be the light box. Except no screws today. After a bit of sanding, just to take off the splintery bits, I needed to cut some braces. Instead of measuring them out, I used a real world measurement. The space between those two rebates was lined up with the stop lock and the miter saw. Then I could cut my first brace and look at that, dead perfect. That allowed me then to chop out the rest. Tell you what, I don't use the band clamp that often, but when you need it in situations like this, uh, I can't imagine doing this with pipe clamps. Only a tiny bit of glue actually, that end piece is going to be tacked in and of course the braces will be glued in and these are being used primarily to force out those bows. I made sure the bows were all pointed inwards so the braces could push them out. Quick check square. And I think the MVP or the MVT most valuable tool for this build would be the Brad Nailer. Could have used screws but geez it was just so much faster. Remember I had four of these things to make. 
The third brace gave me somewhere to screw the removable side in on the other end, and this is so I could slide the boxes in and out. Originally, that's how I was intending to install them. You'll see what went wrong a little bit later. Shortly later, we had the four boxes made and it was time to do a test fit, which I probably should have done after the first one. It did take a little bit of persuading to get the lights in, but fortunately, a nice snug fit at the end. Screw on the end cap, time for the test. Well, that was a tight fit. I drill a hole on the side for this eventually. Let's make sure this works. See if we can blind you. Here we go. Now I needed a little half hole in order to get the cable through when these were flush up against the roof. So two pieces of scrap clamped in the right position gave me the U shape that I need. Another quick sand, just to get rid of all these sharp edges and any imperfections. Use a file on the inside to save my sandpaper. And it's time for a lick of paint. You know what would be really good right about now? Some decent light. Don't worry, not gonna make you watch it all. Where does lick of paint come from? Why would you lick paint? So these are my little angles that I've bought to mount these to the ceiling with. Gonna need concrete plugs up there, of course. But because this is only some crap 12mm plywood, I wasn't going to be able to get very long screws in. So what we're going to do is quickly tack down an extra block, and that'll give me a bit of extra meat in order to get some support on these angle brackets. Not that there's a lot of weight, but better safe than sorry with an $80 light. A little bit of claret on the knuckles, never hurt anyone. There we go, four boxes fitted and tested and ready for assembly on the ceiling. But before we do that, let's give them a quick burst. Boom! I've probably gone completely black, but this is pumping out 2000 lux at two meters, which is about the height of the ceiling to almost my floor, so even better, higher up. Lux is lumens per square meter, and the target for detailed assembly is about 2000 so these are bang on what I need, and when they're evenly spread around the ceiling, that should be a fairly uniform, fairly shadow-free, soft light coming down to my work surfaces. Cheer. And there are my brackets on. What do you mean they used to be on the inside? No, 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 they've always been out here. It wasn't at all because I discovered that when I was going to screw these boxes from the inside to the roof, that I then didn't have enough space to slide the 1.2 meter long lights into the boxes, therefore rendering that design completely useless. No, it wasn't that at all. I just think the shiny wings on the outside look much better. Tell you what, mounting these has taken longer than building them. That's a bit lighter, should be easier to line up with my marks here and here for the drill holes. All right, hammer time. So I broke out my combi drill, which does have a hammer function, which will get through bricks quite easily. But this is reinforced concrete and it just wasn't cutting it, even with those guns. So a quick pop down to my mate's place, who's got a few extra tools. And we borrowed the SDS Rotary from AEG. Uh, don't tell, don't tell my Makita boys there that these uh, oranges in the workshop. Oh yeah. This is in real time, the first one. It just melted through that concrete when the combi drill couldn't make a dent. I resisted buying myself the Makita rotary drill, but now that I've played with one, if I ever have to do this again, I think it'll be on the shopping list. A couple of greenies, and do that 16 times for all the holes. And finally it was time to mount. Check out that one-handed action. Oh yeah. And shotgun with the magnetic bit. I'm using Craig screws here. Easier to drive, and the pan head's beneficial for this style of bracket.
plug them into the new power sockets and then discover we have a really big problem because where one of the lights needs to go the bloody hot water service runs along the ceiling and I can't move that. So we need a solution. Time to build another box. Right, so to flesh out my box by the 140 mil that I need to avoid the hot water pipe, I just quickly glued and tacked in these little braces. I'm gonna do the same on the other side and that's gonna drop it down the height we need. I won't bore you with the construction as it was basically the same as before, but this one gets a few big checkouts with the jigsaw and of course doesn't need a rebate. That should solve the problem, hopefully. Let's try it. Something like that. And here's how I was going to install all the lights before I discovered I had to flip the brackets around. In fact, over the installation of the four ceiling boxes, I think I did them in four different ways. It was definitely the hardest part of the build. And they're all in and painted. I decided that this one here would follow the angle of the wall. So it looks a bit funny when you side it up next to that one. But the whole point is eventually one day there might be a workbench there. So having the light directly above will be brilliant. Looking pretty schmick, but that's not what you want to see. What you want to see is how much extra light they've given. So I could run the side-by-side -side comparison with the same ambient light. I used the original bulb and took some lux readings and then turned on the brand new lights and took the new ones. And here you can see the changes as we go from the back of the workshop through the middle of the workshop where the old light bulb was, underneath the black garage door, outside, over to the miter station, going past the garage door again, back through the middle of the room and finishing in the back corner. Overall, it looks like we've got about three times light, but that's not the whole story because that three times light exists everywhere. Whereas previously, I could only get the single pinpoint right in the middle under the light bulb. Look at the smile on this face. You can even see it all the way across the garage. Apologies, it's a bit echoey, but for this purpose, just to demonstrate the lovely even light, I can't see almost any shadow being cast because of the multi-directional nature of the soft boxes that I've got up there. Right, you still with me, Jesper? Let's get a bit more serious with my Makita tool cabinet. Digging through all of my scraps, I've got this mess. There should be just enough. Let's get chopping as my pegboard gets a little bit of an upgrade. Right, first things first, I'd like to introduce you to Chopper Chris, the new name for my Makita circular saw. What I'm going to be doing first is using the AccuCut to get a straight edge and the miter saw to get the perpendicular edge nice and clean because this is all reclaimed plywood that I got off Facebook Marketplace or the side of the road. So I didn't have to pay anything for it, but it did present a few issues as it's all kind of random widths and random thicknesses, which is tricky for the pocket hole joinery that'll come later on. When you are doing these long rip cuts, don't forget to plug in your cyclone backwards so that it does absolutely nothing and creates a jolly great mess. But clamping two pieces together allows you to get them to the exact same dimensions. And then using the top piece, I could transfer that to the side walls. And quick as you like, I would have the four pieces for the main carcass of the tool cabinet cut out ready for assembly. If you didn't want all this fuss and bother with my warped plywood, you could of course just go to the shop and buy some new stuff. Melamine would also work really well. MDF would probably get a bit heavy. But I'm cheap and I like to use free wood when I can, even though it's a little bit of extra work. I'll be hanging these to the wall using a giant French cleat. Here is the stock material for that. So I'm just setting up my router table fence with a six millimeter bit so that the cleat has plenty of space behind it. This trench that I'm cutting now is going to be for holding the pegboard in place. So with the vacuum sucking it down nice and tight, I can do through cuts on the side pieces, but on the top and bottom, I need stop cuts. Well, I don't have to, but this way you won't be able to see the trench at the edge of the board. So we use the center line as the start plunge, and I drew a second little line on the fence there for the stop. This doesn't have to be 100% balanced all the same. 
And the vacuum does actually make it a little bit hard to push through at times, but it keeps those trenches fairly clean and helps to stop the burning. Once I've got them marked out on all four pieces, I can raise the bit. The Craig Multimark here is actually a really handy little tool for setting the depth of router bits like so. Then I can raise it up to its full depth, run the boards through a second time, plunging where necessary, and I've got the groove I need to accept the piece of pegboard in the new cabinet. With those four bits done, it's time to mark out the pocket holes. One behind the pegboard, two in front. Grab the K5 and start drilling away for what should be relatively straightforward assembly. Corner clamps make this nice and easy, but you could just use regular long ones. Plow in some coarse thread screws, as this is just pine plywood. And pretty soon, we'll have a box, just for something different. Before I can go any further, I actually need this bit of pegboard because in true fixer fingers style, I'm gonna recycle that rather than buying a new piece. And it does make me a little bit sad. Those who have followed this channel for a very long time and don't like themselves very much, might remember that this pegboard was in fact the very first thing I ever built and filmed. It was only like the second or third thing I'd actually ever built, period. And it really shows. To save you going back and watching the 45 minute horrendousness that is that four series of videos, you can see the gaps here, they're joined together because I didn't have a long enough piece of wood. And again, some things never change. I didn't want to go buy a longer piece. I tried to mitre these. I've actually got screws shoved in the side because they were really crappy and I learned you couldn't put glue on end grain very, very easily. And quite frankly, it's a little bit sentimental. But it is also going to be a demonstration of two years down the track how far my skills have come from struggling for days to build this very simple pegboard to a slightly more complicated and much better looking and much more practical tool cabinet. All right, enough chat. Let's get the tools off and trim that pegboard down to its new size. Quick tip, take a photo and when you go to put the tools back on, you'll remember where all your hooks were. Okie dokes, all clean. All right, it's time to break the old girl up. And success. I've got a piece of pegboard back. I mean, take a look at this thing. <laughs> That's how I extended a couple of pieces of wood. I remember doing the routing. It was absolutely disgraceful and dangerous. All good things come to an end and this wasn't really a good thing to start with. So of course I hadn't screwed the top on yet because I needed it off to install the pegboard which I was measuring out here and wondering why my pegboard was so wide and my top was so small. I had just completely miscalculated the amount of plywood that I had and had to resort to a little trick ironically much like I did on the first variation of this pegboard project to extend the width of the cabinet out to where it needed to be. With that done, I could trim the pegboard down to size, slide it in, and finish the box construction of the main part of the cabinet. So while it's a tiny bit smaller than the old one, it will keep the dust off the tools. And when we're all said and done, there's actually going to be double the amount of storage that I previously had. Finding the 45 middle of the French cleat for the back and getting the circular saw about in the right spot. This doesn't have to be perfect, close enough is good enough. So running the chopper through at a 45 at full depth just needs you to take your time and stop before you get right to the end, then cross cut off the last bit. That'll stop the blade from binding if you complete the cut while putting pressure on, holding it in a clamp like I had. Once there, you can mark off, trim down and flush fit the cleat. That little code you can see in the corner is purely because I have some electrical conduit going down the wall and I needed to make space for it. And we'll install that with a few pocket holes as well. This will also act as a brace piece for the top of the cabinet.
When you cut the wall piece, make sure that it is you know, a good 5-10 centimeters smaller. This will help you with installation later on. Not a critical dimension, just as long as it does give you that wiggle room. And then while it didn't have a cleat on it, I cut a very similar piece to install down the bottom in order to improve the rigidity. I am lucky slash cursed to have bricks everywhere, so I have to break out the hammer drill, install my cleat, and then make sure everything was nice and level as the cabinet gets its first test fit on the wall. With the cabinet up, I can just double check that my doors are going to be the correct size, and we can go into another little cutty montage over at the miter saw. Very, very similar construction to the main box, but they're going to be roughly square instead and half the distance. I don't usually plug my pocket holes, but when I put one in a completely stupid spot, here is a quick method you can use just to hide those up. You could plug every pocket hole, but as this is workshop furniture, they really don't bother me. Just like before, a couple of corner clamps, a couple of screws, and we'll have two hopefully fairly similar and square frames for my cleat doors. The fronts of these will be MDF like the other cabinets I've made for the workshop. This is 18 mil thick. And again, Chopper Chris and I can use the AccuCut to get the squares down to the right shape. Bang in a whole bunch of screws all the way around and something that vaguely looks like a chunky door should be in front of you. And just because I'm determined to be as tight ass and lazy as possible, I couldn't be bothered going out and buying more 18 mil MDF when I didn't have enough for the second cabinet. So I glued and screwed a few pieces together. It's only workshop furniture and it's gonna be painted anyway. Using a flush trim bit on the router, I can use that to get the MDF to match up to the sides of the ply perfectly. If you overcut the MDF by a mill or two, this is a great step for a clean edge. Make sure you remove the screws first as they will be too long. You're gonna expose the holes by doing this. Then putting the plunge base on and a giant chamfer bit. I just like this little transition at the top of all of my cabinets. So I make sure I put it on and then I just grind off the tips of the screws that protrude through the chamfer. Just an optional aesthetic step. For door pulls, I don't like hardware or anything sticking out. So now I've got the chamfer bit in the router table and this does not have to be exact at all. I just made sure I positioned it between two of the pocket screws. So again, we didn't have any clashes. Repeat that process on the inside of the carcass and then reattach the front for a lovely little handle pull that no one else will notice but you. Last job for Chopper Chris today was to cut the French cleats for the inside of those doors. I knew I had to work some bed slats in here for Dave Kelly and I have done so. The size of these and the spacing is not really critical but mine ended up being about 50 mil or two inches for the cleats. Save all those little offcuts because they will come in handy later. Once I trimmed one down to the exact correct size, I could then put the stop block onto the miter station and cut out the other nine cleats I needed, one after the other. Bang, bang, bang. Pre-drilling, countersinking will make life a lot easier. Then I can use these little spacer blocks and I'm simply putting two screws in here, no glue, nothing in the middle. They're not gonna hold a huge amount of weight. This should be more than sufficient. Once they're driven in place, the doors are pretty much good to attach. Here's how the French cleats will work. Here are some of the offcuts. Effectively, you can move them around, they hold in really securely, and you make individual tool holders for whatever it is you want to hang on there. I did start with regular butt hinges, but I got a bit of sag. So I did a quick shout out on the Aussie Makers group and got some awesome suggestions. The one I decided to go for was a piano hinge, and this limiting that problem as they can take quite a bit of weight. May not look the prettiest, but that didn't bother me. Again, workshop furniture.
I managed to get some that were almost exactly the right length, so I only had a tiny bit to cut off and grind. For the door catches, I actually added a few rare earth magnets, just polyurethane glued into place to hold them shut nicely. And here is an example of a tool holder. I've only made the one for now. I'll spend the next week making a whole bunch more. This one's for my screwdrivers. That little wedge in the top just helps to hold it in position nicely so that when you move the door, it doesn't flop around. Taping up my MDF, undercoating, and giving it a lovely coat of Fix It Fingers Workshop Blue TM. I love pulling off the tape at the end. Very satisfying, nice sharp edges. And this guy has held up really well. Doors still haven't sagged and I've crammed even more Makita into it over the years. From one of my best workshop builds to one of my crappiest. Let's go. The last project, the tool cabinet, is serving its purpose. I've got a few more little bits and pieces to do. But as we said, the power tools are going to live on the pegboard once I get all of the hand tools onto the French cleats. But some of the power tools that I use most regularly being the drill drivers and the nail gun, I'm actually going to make a station under here to hang them and it's going to house not only the battery chargers for the Makitas but also the battery chargers for the camera and the light as well because they need to be accessed very frequently here. All going to be made out of completely rubbish side of the road scrap plywood just like the last one and we should have a bit of fun because I'm winging it. That are my plans right there. We're going to do this on the fly, which is not really fix-it-fingers style, but we'll see how it turns out. Let's go. Right, so straight off the bat, every single piece of plywood is probably from a different place. They're all different thicknesses, and what I've done is marked out my biggest scraps with the dimensions, and that allowed me to go through, and whenever I needed a piece, try to find one that was going to give me the least amount of waste, so I could use these up effectively. The bottoms and sides were roughly 17 mils. So I used the actual drills themselves just to mark out where I wanted the center divider and the two edge bits to go. Then it was a matter of marking out the holes. I decided to mount them the right way up instead of upside down like some people do. This has given me a bit more variation, but I just like to be able to grab pistol grip those off the rack. So we've measured out the width of them and the three drills came roughly to the same dimension so I could do a practice cut on another piece of scrap. The nail gun though, it was a bit wider and needed to be a lot deeper. So that kind of dictated how deep my shelf needed to be. Once I had a nice fit for all of them, I transferred those marks onto my main blank and over to the inverted jigsaw, we were able to cut out those voids. I do like the inverted jigsaw for a lot of applications where I'm cutting to a line like this. It may be a tiny bit slower than using the jigsaw normally, but the visibility you get is far superior. And of course the best thing about this build is, no one's ever going to see this and it's all crap wood, so I can be dodgy as heck with these cuts and just very quickly clean them up with some sandpaper. No need to be fussy here at all. One of many test fits going on to make sure everything is sitting pretty and not going to fall out on me. And because I never use my router without the router table, here I am going in the completely wrong direction with a small round over bit. Just taking off those edges backwards. And the second test fit looking nice and pretty. Grabbing another conveniently sized piece of scrap for the top, I just trace that out. And hang on a second, what's that? Ah, more of that later. It's not actually set up yet, but it still functions as a straight edge. So Chopper Chris and I could rip that piece down over to the miter saw, cut it to the correct dimensions, router off with a round over bit the edge as well. And I've got a top now for the drill station. Time to cut out the three sides. Ooh, that was a bit close to the clamp. But it worked. 
Here are the two outside walls. And then for the middle divider, I had this lovely architectural design here, which I just decided to throw in. Save me some work. Now, there's probably not really any reason to pocket hole this together, but I do like them, and in my head, they are stronger than just butt screwing things together. I'm not gonna use any glue. And again, for reasons that amuse me, I like to alternate the pocket holes, particularly on the middle bits. But there was some method to the madness, particularly with that one in the middle, which you'll see when it comes to final assembly. So here's screwing the walls to the base, and this wasn't terribly tricky. So when we get to flipping it over and attaching the top, now you'll see why I've only put the pocket holes in the middle where I can reach them. So outside, nicely done, but inside, conveniently, these holes just allowed me to get the long driver bit in and lock everything down. There were two right in the middle though where the pocket holes wouldn't reach at all, so we reverted to the regular old countersinking and butt jointing. Now she's nearly done, and again for reasons that bemuse me now looking back on this, I decided to put a cleat on. I've just got cleats on the brain recently. Uh, this would have been much easier if I had just screwed a solid piece of wood on and then bolted it to the wall, but hey, who knows, one day I might change workshops and have to move this. So recycling some of the French cleats from the tool chest cabinet last week. And like usual, cutting the wall section that little bit smaller so there's an easy fit. I clamp the driver station to the tool cabinet, then use some chocks in order to have the pre-drilled cleat in the correct position. And this allowed me to transfer the marks onto the wall so that when I pulled it away, I could line things up with the hammer drill, level them off, drive in, smack in some plugs, and have my two small cleats mounted. This stopped me from having to remove the tool cabinet and it weighs a ton, so that wasn't bloody well gonna happen. Apart from securely fastening it to the brick wall, because this is gonna take quite a bit of weight, those tools are heavy, I also put some screws into the tool cabinet itself, and then I could drive in some long screws into the brick wall, which gave it that nice rigidity. A final test fit, and there were two things that annoyed me. That older Makita drill didn't fit nicely, and also when I had long bits on there, they were touching the bricks, which is not fantastic. It will blunt them. So two little wedges solved the first problem, and screwing some very thin offcuts from my sandpaper testing to the back of the cleat solved the second problem. With that half done, it was time to move on to the charging station, and I'll spare you most of this as it's very similar construction. We got out the mystery straight edge, we ripped some bits off, we cross-cut some things over at the miter saw. We drove some pocket holes and we forgot to film the most important part here of cutting off a 45 to allow cable management later. We switch it over to the impact driver in order to get into this tight space and still drive those screws. And of course, we didn't have a piece large enough. So just like last week, we had to extend one of the boards with these sideways panel pocket screws because that's what I do. Here was a nifty little trick that I worked out. I decided I wanted a shelf halfway-ish up and down on the charger station, but even with the impact driver, I couldn't get the drill bit in, so I took it off, marked out the holes by hand, then applied it, and was able to fit the small drilling device in to give me the two variable shelf pin holes that I needed, and that worked out quite nicely. Nearly done now, clamped it in, fed the cord through because without unscrewing it, I wouldn't be able to do that otherwise. Four-way power board for the four things I need to charge. A couple of love taps in the place. And this little thing I got from Audi on a whim. I thought that's gonna come in handy one day. It's now sat in a drawer for six months, but today it was its time to shine and it was 10 bucks very well spent because this one isn't taking any weight. So I didn't want to drill it into the bricks. I just put six screws into the tool cabinet directly and that seems to have been more than sufficient. Running my cables through, plugging in the charges for the camera and for the light. Quickly cut out a shelf to the appropriate dimensions, just 12 mil scrap ply, which will hold some batteries. And a 
I'm glad that the height I put in there gives me easy access without bashing my hand to put the batteries on the charger. She's done! I'd like you to meet Kevin, my random orbital sander. Recently, a bunch of Kevin's mates got themselves a brand new swanky home. And Kevin's a bit jealous because he lives in a box. He has quite the wardrobe that he needs to be able to store because Kevin loves getting dressed up, going for walks, some good old suction, spinning out and dreaming of a brand new home. But mostly, Kevin just loves making sawdust. And in true making sawdust style, this project will be completely scrap wood because you gotta use what you got and not what you ain't. Whenever you're trying to use up the bits and bobs that are lying around the workshop, start with the biggest piece. Here I am chopping down to length the two sides of the sanding station and then using my straight edge guide just to give me a clean edge on one side. Roughly chopping them in half. Then I can take the two sides, line them up together and rip off the other edge to make sure they're exactly the same width. Using the width of the side panels, I can set the stop lock to give me the correct dimensions for the top and the bottom of the sanding station. The top piece will be significantly narrower than the bottom piece, as later on I'm going to put a bit of an angle on here just for a nice aesthetic detail. Kevin himself jumps in to help with the sanding. I do like to sand all of my pieces as I go, and as these rough construction bits of timber need it, it saves time down the track. No pocket holes today, shock horror. We're going to be using rebates and dados in order to assemble the vast majority of this little sanding cabinet. Over at the router station, I have set myself up a test cut to ensure that the rebate is the correct width. I can't give you any dimensions here because every single piece of plywood was a slightly different thickness, having all been found in the gutter. The straight edge guide is not only useful for Chris, my circular saw, but in just a few seconds, I can put the 12 mm router bit in and reset my guide stops for that. So I can take both the side pieces, use the straight edge guide to dado out a nice little groove halfway. And then come back to the complete depth to roughly halfway through that 17 mm bit of plywood. Fortunately, my 12 mm fits in nice and snug and that will be perfectly aligned on either side. Test fit and the main support shelf going in. Again, I think this is 12 mil. Using real world measurements rather than actually getting the ruler out makes life a lot easier. That's a nice fit and perfectly aligned because we cut them at the same time. I currently run a 125 mil or five inch sanding system, but I'm making the slots big enough for six inch just in case I ever step up. Doing a little backwards relief climb cut here will help prevent blowout when you push through for the maximum depth. Again, this one was pretty easy because it's also 12 mil. Then I went to some nine mil stock instead just to make things narrower. So I had to do this in a few passes and edged across the straight edge guide using a six millimeter quarter inch router bit. And we got a nice fit there too. A lot of repetition in here, nothing terribly difficult about the construction. Find a piece of scrap that is approximately the right size, cut it down, sand off all the ugly gutter crap that's been stuck to it. And then where I need multiple pieces, I make one very nicely and use it as a template to get the second divider in this case that I need. These not only are vertical supports, but they will hold half sheets of sandpaper, the regular hand sandy type stuff. Here is that angled cut that I spoke about at the beginning purely there for aesthetics. And this time I remembered to drill my shelf pin holes before I assembled everything. 
The little jig makes it nice and easy, although I did come a cropper with this later on, as you'll see, but for the moment it was looking good. They will be where I hold each of the discs. Assembly time. You can glue and screw or just glue and clamp this together because I am lazy. I am going to whack my glue in, put the rebates together and just use the clamps to hold it nice and steady for a moment. While I whack in a few brad nails. This just means that I can keep progressing with the build and not have to wait for the glue to dry. But you could just leave it overnight if you wanted to. So there's the main box done. Tacka tacka tacka. The support shelf with the pre-cut dados all ready to go. Marking out where I need to put a line of brads in to hold it all together. This was the only bit that caused me some grief. Not sure how I mismarked this out, but uh, that little piece there, she's on a wee bit of an angle. I could have remade it, but ultimately I just didn't care. This is shop furniture and it adds some rustic charm. Meh, who guys. I've been wanting some countersink bits for ages and I finally picked some up off Amazon. There are some decent quality ones. They're really nice, they work well, and they just save a step here. Very, very handy. Test fit, looking good. Drill through the cleat into the bricks. I forgot to put the finger pulls in before I assembled and glued all this together. So out comes a giant cove bit in the router. And I carefully maneuvered that into position. Dremel sander just to clean up the edges. That'll allow me to get the sandpaper in and out a bit easier. But it was then time for the draw manufacturing. How's this for a piston bit? Yeah, not. That's just pretty damn good. There's a Louis instant replay. This is the simplest possible draw you can make. Four bits, measured, cut to size, held together with clamps, and bratted in. Nothing special. I've not actually ever used my rebate bit before, and I wanted to in this situation, but I don't have multiple bearings, and that particular cutter was far too big for the 12mm plywood draw, so I got some 6mm MDF and just clamped that into position, and that gave me the correct spacing in order to rebate out my base correctly. It was messy as hell, but damn it worked, and I was pretty impressed with that. Nice little hack. And a lot more impressive than my dodgy hand tool skills, where I squared off the corners with a chisel, and then cut a 6mm bit of MDF, just to fit in there quite nicely. Glued down with a brick. We were really starting to reach the uh, end of my scraps here, so I was getting some particularly dodgy bits of MDF. I remembered the finger pulls this time, clamped four of the bits together, and with a force in a bit, could end up with four semicircles. Nice and easily for my shelves. Sticking with the scrap MDF, this is 18mm, and it will be my draw front with my patent pending double chamfer on either side to avoid the hardware. Bit of CA glue, bit of wood glue on there and some packers allows me to position the draw front cleanly. Once it's grabbed, pull it out, clamp that down, nothing else. No screws in from the back, it's just going to be cheap and nasty like we said. Some aesthetic trim stuck onto the top with another nice chamfer. And then using the planer to bring it down to the top because cutting small pieces like that is quite difficult. Sealing the MDF with some primer. A coat of Workshop Blue TM and attaching it to the wall with a couple of screws. I of course had pre-drilled out through the bricks and got some plugs in there to hold it. They're the common grits that I use, just marked with a pen and of course I'm stocking up with my favourite abronets. The little drawer holds some sanding accessories and Kevin finally has his brand new home Next to his mate Dirk, the little sanding block. <laughs> and now for the catch 22. I should have built this bench first, but it took me this long to get the skills to build this bench. G'day fixers. 
Now that my tool storage area is pretty much done, it's time to turn our attention to this crappy old bench. It is literally one of the first things that I ever built, but it's time has come. Its replacement is going to be made primarily of these scabbed bed slats, as usual here in the Fix It Fingers workshop. And as usual, trying to find the straight ones is pretty hard. I knocked up a design in SketchUp. It's going to be a frame made out of bed slats and a top salvaged from an old IKEA desk. A bit of trim around the side, a few dog holes, and of course some Craig hardware for the clamping track and the clamp vise. Workshop projects means rough and ready construction. The legs are going to be two parts, two of these bed slats, each one of them cut slightly shorter than the other in order to give me a bit of a faux half lap joint so that the top frame has something strong to rest on. That's how my little joint's going to come together. So I've got all four legs here and I do have to make a cheeky little checkout using the actual piece of material to mark it to the correct size. Setting the circular saw to depth. And Chopper Chris is going to get a bit of a workout today. Many passes. And then bash it out with a hammer. Bit of crude old chisel work until we get the nice fit for what will be the top of the frame. At least I know I can cut square. They're standing by themselves. That's what the legs are going to look like. I've only given everything a very, very rough sand here. It is workshop furniture. Bit of the old type on with the Dana Super Spreader. And because I don't have enough clamps and am too lazy, these screws are simply to peg the stuff together until it's all dried up. While those legs dry, time to work on the top box frame. Couldn't use a stop box for the long pieces, so I had to reference them off each other. And in the little side braces, we're going to use pocket hole construction here primarily. I am loving the auto adjust function on my new Craig jig. Now you can use the fancy corner clamps to make your life fairly easy when assembling these large frames. But if you don't have them, a little corner square such as this one will get you out of trouble. That's the middle brace going in. Legs are all dried, ready to roll. We can mark out where, again, we're going to use a couple of pocket holes to attach these to the top frame. Pulling the block off the old K5, still coming in handy. My little portable drilling solution here is going to put them in the right spot. On the back, I have to get even more creative and manually lay them out. Whenever you need to do this, make sure you do a test piece first. This crack opened up a little bit due to the bent nature of the bed slats. Using a card to force the glue into the joint and the clamp got me out of trouble. I love this style of joinery because it is just so darn quick to put together. Positioning the legs, screwing the pocket holes, and then on that piece at the back, it just gets a regular old screw. Not too heavy yet, but very stable so far. Right now, all I'm going to do here is pretty much replicate that top frame down the bottom. But the one at the back needed to have a little bit ripped off. So I'm setting up my thin ripping jig here and doing the old clamp dance. Like my clamp podcast clamp. Grant made that for me. It's nice. So the long section goes down the back. You will note that the frame is only on three sides. I want it open at the front so that I'll be able to roll, hopefully, a smaller workbench underneath in the future. I could have put the pocket holes on the bottom so you couldn't see them, but I couldn't be bothered. Much easier doing it this way. Bed slats are never really flat, so using the clamp to pull them together, trusting that the wood is the correct length. One more brace in the back. And my frame is pretty much done. 
Time to go, little old workbench. You served me well, but you were a piece of crap. This one, much more stable. Now, you'll see throughout the rest of this build, the workbench wobbles like no tomorrow. And that is because these casters are rubbish. Now, they were 10 bucks from Audi, so I shouldn't really complain. They're just not suitable for what I'm doing here. I think I'm going to get some of those drop-down casters eventually. But for the rest of the build, the stability is compromised by these crappy little wheels. Right, time to get on the top. Here are these reclaimed benches that I found on the side of the road. Chopper Chris and my AccuCut making short work of cutting out a nice rectangle appropriate for the size of my bench. Now I will point out here, this is not the best way to do this. Because of the limitations of my garage, I have made my work surface the same size as my frame to get the most stability. For the clamping track you're going to see in a short moment, having an overhang is actually much, much, much easier for your installation. But this is the way I chose to do it. So that's the sub layer, simply screwed on in. Then we consult the instructions because these measurements are critical. You can see the purple text are down the side where I've marked where my bolts are going to go. And again, due to the size of my garage, I've had to trim down one of the tracks. Now these things are super solid, but they are still only aluminium. So your regular woodworking blade, if you take it nice and slow, can cut through. Uh, Stiablo blade is awesome. Such a clean cut. Don't worry, that off cut will not go to waste. An awful lot of marking out to be careful with here to position where my holes need to go through. And using an awl is a very good idea with the melamine so your drill bit doesn't slip around everywhere. Need to take the sub base off for just a moment. Try to avoid some blowout by putting a board underneath. These holes are for the bolts that will anchor the clamping track to that sub base. Now, because I don't have an overhang, I need to take an extra step here and I need to mark out using my lovely 2x Forge new marking knife. Check out Stabby McStab face there, it's awesome. Then I grab my Forstner bit and put a little recess in so those bolt heads will have somewhere to live. I then realized that when the track goes down, I won't be able to screw the top back to the frame. So I had to plug in a couple of pocket holes on the outside. Again, you could put them on the inside, but I just couldn't be bothered. Here's another problem I created myself. The instructions say to use three quarter or 19 millimeter stock for these tracks. And if you do, your life will be easy. Because I'm using reclaimed materials for the desktop, I needed to take a router and rebate out one millimeter because it was 18 so that when I put my top on it clears the track just a little bit. Now melamine is an absolute mongrel to try and route. Chip outs absolutely everywhere. I minimized it as much as I could. The good news is this is the sub base so you won't really see them. But a bit of chisel work on the end will give me at least a respectable sort of fit. Using the offcut as a straight edge to route out that same longer channel on the other side. And the tedious process of installing all of the bolts from underneath. However, once they're done, it's pretty fun to slide this in. Go on, get in there. Now, don't tighten these up all the way. You're going to want to check square in just a second. Plop, 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 plop. In goes the long bit. Then we grab the big framing square, hold everything nice and steady, and then tighten down those bolts. So those bolt heads will now fit into the little counter balls that I did earlier. And check out the right hand side there, you'll notice where I have screwed in my offcut. Now, this is giving me an extra anchor point, however, it will also cause me a little problem in a moment. Here's a quick demo of how you can use the bench. You don't have to put the extra top on. You can use this square corner to be a reference point. Slide in your bench clamp, and obviously designed to really help with your pocket hole construction, but I don't want to do that. The Auto Max will adjust to different heights super quick. 
Now I want to be able to slide pieces over the whole workbench. So I've got a second one of the benches, which you'll believe it or not, I also managed to get off the side of the road. And here I'm using the jigsaw to quickly cut out that recess for the offcut. So again, an extra little step. I am overcomplicating things as usual. Blue tape helps to stop the chip out as I use the router and a bit of a straight edge underneath the board that you can't see to make that the correct size. So when I drop down at my top, it fits on there. Also note the slight little finger hole to allow the clamp to go in on the small piece. No fancy joinery for the top, it's melamine, it's not gonna move. Just getting underneath and banging in a whole bunch of screws around the edge. Now I made that top a tiny bit oversized compared to the sub base, so I could come back and do this. Flush trim bit, blue tape, it cut a lot better than I thought it was going to. And that gives me a beautiful surface to screw in the edge trim. More bed slats. Already the clamping bench is coming in handy for building the clamping bench. You know, the old staples. And look, these miters aren't going to be perfect. I'm just rough cutting them on the miter saw. It's pretty darn accurate, good enough for this. Here's a nifty trick. I wanted to use these bed slats, but they weren't long enough to go down the long edge. So cut a 45, bang your pocket holes in for 19 mil as usual. Line them up carefully using your new clamping bench. Smack the screws in, and you have effectively very neatly extended one bed slat into two bed slats. Now I want to keep that in the middle, so when I trim these down to the correct length, I took equal amounts off either end. Here's a good tip. Using another offcut, I can line that up to the exact height that I want these trim pieces to sit. Use the mark out tool to find out where the screws need to go in. And then mark, drill, countersink with the lovely countersink bits and secure the trim to the side. Once I had the two end pieces on, I can use those as a reference and slowly sneak up on a good enough fit for the long side pieces. To hide my dodgy miters, grab a screwdriver and run the side of it folding over the little soft pine edge. It'll cover most sins. Time for some more hardware. This is the Craig Clamp vise and I'm going to use it instead of a traditional vise. I need to rebate out a little bit of this piece, so just marking it out there using the vise itself. Then over to the router table. Didn't need a flush trim bit, just the way I had it set up and making that channel a little bit longer than it needs to be so that again the clamps can get in at the side. This has to be the easiest vise to install in the world. It's simply two more screws. Drill those out, sink them in carefully. Of course they require quite a bit of torque. I like to finish them off with the screwdriver. Then you've got those T-channels there where you can clamp in very securely. Do you like my new mallet? Vando's Woodshop. Oh yeah, it's nice. Now I don't want it sitting out like this though. I want to make it flush. So we're just going to take that off another time. Mark it out with Savvy McSab face. Use the plate itself to set the desired depth on the router. And then hog away most of the material. When I got close to the edge, the Japanese pull saw comes out, cut that down to length, and my Vando mallet does a nice job of cleaning away the waste. I almost feel like a woodworker. More chisel work than I've done in six months on this project. And there's the final install on the vise. Quick demo, now it's flush, I can hold long pieces, flush up against my workbench. Now this was gonna be a little bit tricky. 
I needed some dog holes, except that while most of your Craig stuff will come in metric, this one has 19 millimeter, three quarter inch dogs, which means I need 19 mil, three quarter inch holes, and I only have a 20 millimeter forced a bit. However, I do have a 19 millimeter spade bit. These things are nasty inaccurate. So if I drill through from the top with a three millimeter guide, then underneath the bench, use the 19 mil spade to start a hole, I can clear out most of the waste from the top with a 13 millimeter drill bit, the biggest one my drill will take. And that's just big enough for a 12 millimeter flush trim router bit to go into that drill hole and use the 19 mil spade hole as a guide. And I know that sounded really complicated, but it worked brilliantly. If you had a three quarter inch forced a bit, you could of course just come in straight from the top and then clean the edges up like I'm doing here with a tiny little round over. The big reveal with the tape and we're just about done. Now those dogs did fit in very nice and here's a demo of how you can use the vise. Obviously how we saw before, you can put it that way. Automax adjusts to the width that way. Or you pop in your dogs and you can use those to hold too. Kevin Sander, he can come out and do the whole top now. Move your dog to the appropriate place and your big sheets can be done as well. A bit of freehand routing, put a straight edge on there to cut a dado, whatever you need to do, it's going to be awesome. Well, that's it guys. This has been a most satisfying build. I have had a huge amount of fun doing it. If you are looking for plans, I will put a link in the description below so you can build one too. And if you are after the hardware, there are of course the Carbotech affiliate links for people in Australia and Amazon links for the folks overseas where you can pick up all of your necessary Craig hardware. I cannot overstate how much I love this bench and how it revolutionized my workflow. Make it and make it early. Then make this. G'day fixes and welcome back to the workshop. Today we are tackling the drill press stand, or really this would be good for any mobile tool that's not too heavy. Going to be a couple of drawers, I whacked up some quick plans in SketchUp, and if you'd like to get a copy of them, I'll put a link in the description below. The first part we're going to start is from the ground up. I am half lapping my favourite bed slats into about a 45 by 50 centimetre frame. I only want to have glue in this section because I'm going to screw wheels in eventually and a bit of other hardware, so don't want any bits of metal I'll have to worry about. This is my quick method for making the half laps, not the most accurate, but this is a workshop project, so it's going to be all scrap and all dodgy. After clearing away most of the waste with the miter saw and a hammer, we just wedge in on the router sled and clear out the rest to about halfway through. No screws, just the glue, as we said, to keep this lovely and metal free. Half laps are pretty good at self alignment, but no harm with some check square action. And now we can move on up the frame and these will be the main wall components. So I'm gonna be building these walls with some shaker style inlays, kind of like I did with the storage for the tracks on my workbench here. Primarily pocket holes gonna be used for the rest of the construction. The only slightly tricky bit to do here is that I'm making another faux half lap joint at the top. So while the bottom one gets screwed in flush like this, the top one I've got a 19 mil offset in order to have that half lap later on. It'll make sense as we go. As we said, shaker style, which means inlaying a panel. This is just a great project for using up all the bits of scrap. I think this is about 17 millimeter leftover plywood that I've had, but the bits are just really small and awkward. So having these inlaid shaker frames, I can use multiple pieces and get rid of some small stuff that's been lying around the workshop. I opted to round over the corners, just finding a little bottle that was about the same as my rebating bit. And then there's no accuracy required here, so just grabbed out the sandpaper on the angle grinder to crudely make those fit into position. 
And this is what I mean about the multiple pieces. Of course, one piece would be much easier, but this will let me get rid of those small awkward bits. Not too much glue in this project, but I will put these in. Cutting in a third piece to fit nicely, no one's going to know. Then we grab Presto the Nail Gun. Thanks, Glenn, for jumping on the membership. He's now sponsoring my favorite little tacker tacker tacker, and you're going to get sick of Hey Presto jokes by the end of this video. Now those sides are all done, made two of them, of course. I can pull the base out of the clamps and simply screw the two sides on from underneath with some dirty great big screws. The back and the front are just going to have some slight structural supports, but there is one more panel to go in. So here is the base of the back of the cabinet. Put another one of those up top. Again, just put down slightly to allow the half rebate so that that piece of 19mm can be screwed in. Then we flip it on its side. Pull it out, chopper crisps and the back panel can be cut to shape just like the two sides. Though this one comes in from the back instead of from the inside. Ironically, the back panel was a solid piece. Tack, 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 tack. One more bed slat across the front and we've got a fairly sturdy frame. And that's what those half lap rebates were for. More scrap for the floor, and my pile of leftover ply was depleting nicely. Right, that's the carcass taken care of. Now let's do some drawers. First time using these Craig Draw Slide installers, and honestly, it probably wasn't any faster, but now I know how to use them. Going forward, they're going to be a great little addition for this fiddly job. That's me lining the drawer front up to the front of the carcass like you should. Then I changed my mind and decided to get tricky and put them in slightly, and then later on I had to reverse this. So just keep it simple, stupid. Don't worry about anything but lining up to the front. I was actually starting to run out of sheet goods, but fortunately I had these off-cut pieces from the melamine top of my clamping bench, and I was able to get some draw sides and fronts out of them. Chopper Chris in the rip cut makes this a simple repetitive cut job. Basically these draw boxes are going to help me use up this melamine stuff. Now, I hate melamine, I don't like using it, it gives you sharp edges, I couldn't be bothered edge banding, but in order to make sure it doesn't end up in the scrap bin, it does make good draw boxes. Not quite the Dave Stanton method here, he does a nice solid melamine draw. Because I didn't want to lose too much depth and I didn't have pieces big enough to form the bases, I'm going to make these drawers pretty much like I made the shaker sides. Screw them all together, then found this very, very convenient sized piece of 9mm ply, about 3 eighths of an inch, to form the bottoms. Kevin the sander helps to clean that up a little bit. And then with a rebating bit and the safety pin in the router table, we can have the incredibly messy task of putting that rebate around the bottom. And this time I opted to actually square off the cut rather than round off the corners. Be very careful doing this with melamine so I don't blow out. Chopping the base piece in half. What a nice tight fit. And again, the glue and presto method. Tack, 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 tack. Slide them on in here, and you can see I'm still stuffing around with the bloody setback draw slides. Don't do that. But I am liking the Craig Draw Slide installers. They do come into their own when you flip the draw around like this. It makes it really easy. You don't even have to detach the second part of the draw. Right, for the draw fronts, I'm using my patented double 45 degree chamfer top and bottom to avoid using hardware. Again, I didn't have any bits of 19mm MDF long enough, so we pocket hold a few of those together. Then created clouds of dust, putting the chamfers on, and because I did this before doing the top, it was actually quite an easy install for the draw fronts. So they'll get a coat of workshop blue, and I again am a tight ass, avoid paying for hardware, 
with those little chamfer draw pools underneath. All right, even more scrappy crappy getting used up. These awkward shaped IKEA melamine, ugh, look at that rubbish. Absolute crappy MDF stuff is good enough for the top. So we cut out a square from the last of it and then just screwed it in from underneath. Speaking of crappy, these are the Audi wheels that cost me 10 bucks for the set. While they were pretty rubbish and I replaced them with the good Carbotech ones on my clamping workbench, they were perfect for this little car. So they do have their place, just not on anything too heavy. I actually cut my little square a bit oversized so that I could come back with the flush trim router and just size it off and don't run your finger along melamine, you get cuts. This was a golden score. They are the bull noses that I cut off a couple of bed slats earlier on and they're going to make a perfect addition for the trim. This is why I hold on to this sort of stuff. You never know when it's going to come in handy. Couldn't be bothered doing fancy mitres this time. We are just simply butt joining and hey presto, we've got ourselves some edge trim. Little flush trim, bit of sandpaper, and I put a bit of wax around there too to finish. Righty, time to screw on the drill press. My little Bosch PBD40 is the whole reason why we made this mobile tool cart. However, Anything that you can fit on here would be pretty good, fairly handy. Use the VIX bit to pilot hole through, and then make the clearance for the bolts. I actually picked up a nice bolt kit from Bunnings, it's about 20 bucks, a couple of hundred pieces in there. Really handy for this sort of stuff. That's nice and secure. However, it needs to live here, and that's currently a whole bunch of crap that needs to find a new home. The Makita hard case will live down there, that was part of the reasoning for the dimensions that the mobile cart is, but it does mean that this section of the workshop is being taken over by actual workshop stuff, which is nice. There should be enough space to do smaller jobs with the cart just in that position. When I don't have the room, I'll be able to roll it out and use it in the middle of the workshop. Clicking in the drawers and a bit of splash magic, and there would lovely workshop blue. For now, these are going to hold all of the bits that are going to go with the drill press, hole saws, force the bits and so on. In the future I might make some inserts, but yeah, good enough for today. Next up is the closest to insanity that I think I have ever found myself in the workshop. 54 drawers, no table saw. G'day fixers, and welcome to my version of Steve Ramsey's small parts storage. A wee while ago, I signed up to Woodworking for Me Immortals The Weekend Workshop course, and I've been greatly enjoying it. I've made a number of the projects, well, my version of the projects, tailored and catered to fit my space, and this one is no different, but I am following his plans relatively closely. I'd highly encourage you to check it out, even if you think you know what you're doing, because like me, you're gonna get inspiration, ideas, and motivation for improving your workspace, which is, you know, what this hobby is all about. Link in the description below. Most of this is going to be made out of recycled plywood. That thicker piece is 3 quarter inch for the main carcass and this darker piece is 15 mil or 5 eighths of an inch which will be the primary dividers. When handling both of these pieces I'm going to try and mark out and cut all of my dados before we cut it down to final size. What I'd really like folks to take away from this particular video is you may have noticed I don't own a table saw. I can't fit one and a car in my little garage, so I'd like to really focus on how I'm using a series of edge guides, ripping jigs, and various other bits and pieces to get around not having the heart of the workshop and show that you can do this with a circular saw and a router. Now annoyingly, I didn't have a 15 mil router bit, so I've had to take an extra step here when cutting these dados. Using circular saw to mark them out from both sides, and then the router to clean up. Ripping down the top and bottom piece, ensuring that way that my dividers will be spaced evenly. But before I can put them in, they too are gonna need a whole bunch of six millimeter or quarter inch grooves 
And I am going to have to use MDF here. Sadly, I couldn't get any 6mm plywood, just short supplies due to various world events. But fortunately, the router table made fairly quick work and gave me some perfectly tight dados. And the good thing of MDF, when it says 6mm, it is 6mm. There is an awful lot of repetition in this build. My version is going to have 54 draws, and that's over 300 pieces and thousands upon thousands of cuts and repetition of various activities. Every time you decide to do something in a project like this, you have to times it by 54, and that's just for the draws. Ooh, here was a little highlight. And one of the risks of using wood that you find in the gutter. For some godforsaken reason, there was a screw head buried in here, and luckily I was taking shallow passes and only just nicked it. And it didn't damage the blade too badly, could still just screw it out. So here's the dry fit of the main frame along with the internal dividers. Yeah, some of them were perfect, some of them were a wee bit tight, and some of them were a wee bit loose. But at the end of the day, a bit of glue and sawdust is going to help me hide those sins. Right, so the first 6mm MDF section will be basically what the drawers are going to sit on. There are no rails here, they're just simple box construction. And the longer I went on, the more efficient I was able to become with my cutting of all of these pieces. Just finding ways to do them in batches. You get faster as you go along, but even so, I think this whole build took me somewhere around 50 to 60 hours of workshop time. But I loved it. It was great fun. It's just really about making the best of what you have. For me, the two primary tools that replace my lack of table saw are this Craig Rip Cut. It's really good. You can set it very, very accurately and make repeatable cuts. Here, if you can figure out a way to clamp down your sheet goods correctly, then you just go one, two, three, four, five, six, however many you need, and then the cross cuts are quickly handled on the miter saw. But even that, you could get away with using a little cross cut jig. While it might have been dodgy, that little momentum there can show you that it dry fit together really well without falling apart. So I was pretty darn happy with that. And it fit in at my space perfectly. That brown plywood was pretty rough and flaky. I think it had gotten quite wet at one stage, but it was holding together all right. And when I was satisfied that everything was going to fit together, I used Presto my nail gun throughout this project to basically speed things up, wouldn't have to wait for the glue to dry. Bit of Type 1 3 into the dados, tack attack attack attacker, and hey presto, we had a frame. Cheeky little tie lapse. These 6 mils were very tight. And sometimes required a bit too much persuasion. Tried not to damage the edge of the MDF, and we got them in eventually. Just a little bit of glue, tiny bit of glue right on the end was all we needed to hold them in place. There were some voids in the plywood and, uh, well, some voids in my cutting. Glue and sawdust mixed together makes a nice little bog paste. Kevin the sander comes out to smooth it all off, and it looks a lot more professional than it really is. Lovely tight fit. Speaking of channel members, Chopper Chris is of course doing most of the work here, my lovely circular saw. And just one after the other, we cut that many draw pieces, because that's where we are at. The frame honestly went together pretty quickly, but these drawers kicked my ass. It was weeks of part-time, couple of hours here, couple of days there, getting everything sorted. The router table, I said getting things done before you cut them to final size was really nice. That lower groove there, rebate, rabbit, whatever you want to call it, is where the base is going to go. The base is just going to be 6mm MDF again and sit flush. However, cutting safely, the rebate on the short edge was going to be tricky on the router table, so I made this custom push block 
and that worked really lovely. I could do one drawer at a time, flip it around, cut the other end, and that gave me the basic shape that I needed to be able to assemble these. Again, just going to be glue and brad nails. Every step of this drawer construction phase needed a jig. I made them all purposely slightly oversized. And this little jig added to the stop block on my miter saw allowed me to get them down to the exact height because eh, guess what? Uh, not all those rows were exactly evenly spaced. So starting oversize and sneaking up on it, I was able to get a lovely tight fit to about a mil, half mil tolerance. In Sydney, we were getting torrential rain and the good news was the workshop was pretty humid. So if this MDF was going to swell, it's going to swell now. If anything, it'll shrink as the rains disappear, which was great for my drawer fitting. Rather be a little bit loose and a little bit tight. Yet another jig, and this time for assembly. A bit of glue allowed me to square up quite nicely on my clamping bench, each of the drawer boxes, and then tack attack attack it with Presto. I had relatively few blowouts on the brad nails. They're only 15 mils, so 5 eighths of an inch again, and they were fantastic. I said hundreds and hundreds of brads went into this, and I only had a couple that I had to come back and fix up afterwards. Steve uses elastic bands, but uh, quite frankly, this was just a lot faster. Final sand with Kevin to custom fit every drawer to the correct slot. It might have taken a really long time, but honestly, it was a lot of fun. And when you get to moments like this where you complete a stage and it just fits in perfectly, it's been one of the most satisfying projects that I think I worked on, even if it took forever. Another really handy tool to get your hands on if you don't have a table saw is a track saw, or in my case, an AccuCut, the poor man's version of a track saw, where Chopper Chris can just mount onto that sled and cut down this time some 12mm MDF for the draw fronts, which I actually got for free from the timber yard because, well, it was a bit of scrap, and when I bought on my 6mm sheets, they gave it to me. The best thing about that Craig sled is you can go from the track saw to the rip cut without changing anything. It just jumps over from one to the other, and it, the two of them combined really do replace a lot of the functions that a table saw will give you. Not quite as fast, not as accurate, but they do it well in a small space. Measuring and marking out my drawer fronts, I put a dirty great big chamfer on the front. The idea was to not have any hardware like I've done on my other drawers and cabinet fronts in the workshop and just use that little chamfer underneath as the pull. That didn't quite work out, but for the moment we were pushing on with that design idea. Here's a handy hack I found to make sure your drawers are fitting perfectly. If you can get them out with a vacuum, they're good. If you can't get them out, then you need to sand them down a little bit more so they're not too tight. I was pretty proud of this little jig, using the clamping bench to its full potential. It just pushes them out about 6mm and supports them from the back. There's not going to be a back on this set of drawers. And by holding them proud, I could paint some glue onto the front, a little bit of super glue, no activator, so I had a few seconds just to manipulate it. A couple of spaces, they're about 2 or 3mm, 1 8 of an inch. And I could use them to mount my lovely drawer fronts. Again, no screws, tack attack attack with Presto the nail gun made life a lot easier. If a driver breaks, well, I know a guy who can fix it. One after the other, and a lot of podcasts on, we got through these repetitive tasks. And again, reaching the end of every stage was just so satisfying. Glued, assembled ready to go in its new home. Having a mobile workbench is also very handy because this thing now weighs an absolute ton. And fit like a glove. All right, so I mentioned that my little chamfer finger pulls weren't going to work. There just wasn't enough space, so I was going to use some dowels instead as knobs. But my drawers were just too big to fit under my drill press, and I didn't want to do this by hand. So how's this for a cheeky hack? I had a bit over two and a quarter inches, 60 millimeters of spare space, which I don't think I really needed. 
So cutting a three quarter inch 19 mil disc using a hole saw, pop that down. I still got 40 millimeters of, well, safety to secure the pole to the drill press stand. And that gave me just enough clearance for my drill bit to do the dowel holes. But first we need some dowel. Another cheeky little jig, kind of like one I made on my bookmark project, just to keep these 54 little knobs for a consistent length. Sometimes hand tools are faster than the power tools. Dirty hack disc sander, puts a tiny little chamfer onto the knobs. And there's some of that torrential rain. God, it nearly flooded that day. Quickly finding center. And then on my elevated drill press, I could use the laser to get relatively accurate holes. I've only recently got this thing. God, it's fun and so much faster than, more accurate than doing it by hand. No risk of blowing through the bottom. And out comes the Vando mallet to smack in the little knobs. Let's double check they all seat properly. And we're getting very close to completion. Smacky, 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 smacky. Checky, 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 checky. And there we go. But I decided those square bottoms just looked crap. And as I was now using draw pulls, back over to the router table for 54 more processes of putting a chamfer on the bottom as well as on the top. And it looked much better. Very happy with that design change. Speaking of Vando, he did point out that, you know, you really should have painted these before putting the draw fronts on. And uh, yeah, yeah, that, that would be a great idea because then I could have avoided doing this uh, all by hand with a paintbrush and you just would have needed to touch them up afterwards. But live and learn. And I was already in the process driven mode. So doing 54 coats of primer and 54 320 grit sanding sessions and 54 bits of blue tape to mask off the knobs. It just flew by in about three days. But I got myself comfy and settled on in. I don't do many shorts, but I did do one on these stop loss bags recently and they're pretty damn cool. Got the idea from Paul the Wood Knight. And I love them. They let you just accurately measure out how much paint you need. You don't waste any, you can mix it really easily. They're fantastic for keeping your finishes. I only did two coats of the Workshop Blue patent pending and then pulled off the tape, let them dry overnight and came back for some brassy gold on the knobs, I think was the choice. One, because it looks cool. Two, because I just happened to have a tube of it lying around. And then finally protecting all of that paint so it doesn't chip off or wear away with one coat of clear water-based poly. Borrowed a labeler from a mate because my memory is going with me old age. And this actually took a whole day in itself, just working out what screws need to go where, how many I can fit in a drawer. And I'm going to say that I designed it this way so that the Craig boxes would fit in there, but that was actually complete and utter ass. It was pure coincidence that they fit in there perfectly. And some of my Phillips head screws, my Robertson head screws, and then I just went through all of my little bits of small storage for washers, nails, brads, plugs, all those sorts of things. Where I could, I made a couple of cheeky little dividers and just one brad nail in the side to store the things that I didn't have that many of, the smaller screws and that sort of bizzo. And they just, as Steve designed it, turned it into a small hardware store of my very own. I got rid of all of that crappy random storage and ended up with this beauty. I think it is my most satisfying project to date and probably the one that I pumped the most number of hours into. It's just such a massive improvement. I loved every step. It took me months, but I don't care. That's what a woodworking hobby is all about. Everything needs a home and these chisels and my new rasp and files do not have one. So that space right there is going to house them in the near future using this pile of steaming crap. This stuff has, except for the Perspex, cost me nothing. And I just want to show you that you can keep building nice-ish looking stuff using junk.
First thing to mention is this little thing, the Fit Finder by Microjig. It's a new tool that Timbercon were kind enough to send out to me to try. I'm not going to review it per se, more so I'm going to use it throughout this project in a variety of different ways. And here's the first one. I want rebates halfway through this plywood and usually I would be doing this sort of procedure, getting the gauge to measure, then using my little depth finder to try and set the bit. This thing, you can drop down onto your workpiece and that little tab coming out the side is now exactly half what the thickness of your workpiece was. Particularly with this recycled plywood and the other recycled bits of junk I'm using, they're all over the shop. So this tool should be very handy. Setting the depth was very easy. And then I could go over to the router table and in a couple of passes, create my rebates. Not just for the router table, but also for the palm router using the edge guide as well. But this is what not to do. Yes, I set it exactly to halfway, but no, I shouldn't be cutting that much with a little trim router. And I nearly started a fire. The second time around, this dado was done correctly in two passes to much nicer effect. Now those bits of ply were some random scrap I had lying around, but this piece I know exactly where it came from. It was part of my very first workbench, most of which has been used in other projects, but this final offcut will now become the shelf in the middle of my hand tool cabinet. Number five jack plane, just cleaning that up to get it fitting correctly into the dado, and then a wee quick sand with Kevin the random orbital sander. Speaking of channel supporters whose names I have given to tools, Presto the nail gun comes out for a bit of tacka tacka action. Glue and brad nails will hold my frame together. This is a good way to get rid of long skinny bits, those off cuts which are really hard to use in situations where you don't need the exact width, smack two of them together. And that little bit of yellow showing through will always remind me of my first workbench. Now we need to rebate out the back of the frame. Keep note here that it looks like I'm going the wrong direction, but I'm now inside a box, so you actually have to come from the other side that you would normally route. However, my router table was not able to get deep enough, so I had to switch to the palm router with a little fence clamped onto the side to get the depth needed for that back panel to fit. I think some of this plywood got wet at one stage and it started to lift the top layer, but a bit of glue and clamp that overnight hides that sin. So one of the things I love about workshop projects is you really don't have to be too precious about things like grain direction on your plywood. I've got this back panel, which I need. I've got this really odd shaped piece of 12 millimeter marine ply, which I want to use. It's not big enough in either L-shaped dimension to work as a piece. I can trim off this piece. I'm going to have the plies going different ways, but honestly, is it worth getting a new sheet of 12 millimeter ply when I have this just because the back of my cabinet is going to be cross-grained? No. So I rounded over the corners so it would fit within the rebate that we cut earlier, but that was still not quite deep enough to take my next bit of scrap wood, which came off my very first project, the pegboard that I built for my workshop a long time ago. It's long since been pulled apart and turned into cleats, but those cleats need to be rebated in. So we quickly pulled out the trim router to do that. Then I could tack a tacker with Presto the back into place and use the fit finder as a marking gauge. Taking half of my cleat, which is where I want my screws to go, I can draw a line and sink them home. Now the cabinet won't hang proud of the wall. Some much fresher bed slats, which I picked up off the side of the road out the front of my house, are going to make the shaker style door for my cabinet. Okay, this is something I was super interested in because obviously the Fit Finder is pretty much ideal for table saws and I don't have one. I'm going to do my half laps for the door on the miter saw using the depth stop. And I was wondering if the Fit Finder can set that depth for me. It's tricky. It's obviously not ideal. It's not really set for this. But I reckon that's pretty good. I can line it up behind here. I can see a tooth. We'll obviously do our regular test cut, and hopefully that half lap on the trenching will work. And it did. Now there's a little bit of bounce and play in miter saws, so it's not ideal, but 
I only had to do one test cut and adjustment instead of three or four like I normally would to do this procedure. As the bed slats were already rounded over, I decided to rather than hide that, accentuate it by rounding over the joining face. Which was easily achieved with my little block plane and a quick bit of sanding. Now I screwed those panels together. I'm not going to glue them because I'm using the perspex in the middle and I need to be able to pull it apart to get that in. Watching Cole from Gifkin's Jig has shown me the value of a slot cutter which conveniently was exactly the same thickness as my Perspex. So the Fit Finder once again found the halfway point to cut that groove and then to match the other things in the workshop, I've put a nice chamfer for all the things on the top and bottom. The hinges I'm using were not exactly scrap, but I did pick them up out of the bargain basement bin at Bunnings, so that three times fast, and decided to go old school recessing them in. And actually got to break out the Vix bits for a change. Don't use them often, but they're handy when I need them. And if this looks like it went together far too easily, you're right. That door did not actually close terribly flush or even, and I had to go back and replug the holes with some chopsticks. But the magic of filming, you don't have to watch that. Mind you, it was the magic of filming which made me rush to do the error in the first place. The smallest piece of scrap wood, being a bit of dowel offcut, again, picked up out of a dumpster would act as the handle for my door and a little 10mm magnet will hold it closed. Quick tip, using a brad point bit will give you a flat bottom which is much better than a standard drill bit when installing magnets. Second quick tip, always check your polarity so your door doesn't end up being bounced away. Put the magnet down and mark it with an X. That's the face to glue. What are we up to? Scrap wood 8. Nope, 9. This piece of cedar I pulled out of my wardrobe in the study when I did a renovation on the sliding doors on that and nearly destroyed my blade because I cut through a few brads which I didn't see which I now have to remove. It is going to form the magnetic tool holder for my chisels, files and my rasp, chamfer all the things and I've got some rare earth magnets to hold those in place which I'm just going to recess in slightly deeper than the width of the magnet so that the tools only ever touch the wood they won't hit the metal because these things are strong but very brittle and we'll just CA glue those in place. Another piece of cedar, this time taken off a window which we pulled out of the building during some repair work, is going to form the lower tool holder. This is where a drill press really shines. I had a similar version of this earlier in my other tool cabinet, but it was a bit wonky because I eyeballed the drill holes. This one looks much nicer, and mounting it with some little step away blocks, just an offcut of the offcut, I decided to get extra fancy and put some contrasting plugs in there. Ooh, that's a bonus bit of scrap wood. That Merbo is off my parents' house when I renovated the veranda. Those step blocks also serve the function of making the handles not clash with the tools stored above it. And you could almost stop here. In fact, I decided to mount the thing to the wall now just to get it out of the way while I do the final stages. But to keep the dust off things, I wanted to make sure I had that door and also install a drawer below. Let's load her up. Moving on to the drawer, making it to match my apothecary style cabinet which had 54 of the buggers in there. Luckily today I'm only making the one, but it will be from the 6mm MDF which I bought for that project. Don't buy wood terribly often but I needed so much of it I had to get two sheets. And these little bits will continue to be useful in this new project. Drawers made exactly the same way as I did previously. Fit finder to find the halfway of the 6mm, very small, only an eighth of an inch. Rebate, glue and brad nail construction. I decided to put a middle divider in there just to give it some strength and rigidity. Use the hand plane to make sure everything fit flush and lovely and then put the files that I made the drawer for in and realize that that divider makes them not fit in the case. Now nah, I'll sort that out later. 
The draw face is a dumped kitchen bench top. 18mm melamine MDF, which I picked up again from the front of my building. Gold mine out there. CA glue holds it on temporarily. And then here's a nifty trick. I pre-drilled the holes before I assembled things, but getting the screw in was a bit of a bugger. And I figured out that those little detachable Phillips head screwdrivers actually fit in a quarter inch socket bit. And that allowed me to get into the tight space. Paint and prime, then remove the screws. And I can knock the door apart to fit in the clear perspex. Chopper Chris comes out again. You can cut perspex with your regular circular saw. This one still had the shielding on it, which helps protect the cut. If you are cutting it without the paper shielding, use some blue tape. That'll stop you getting chips along the edge. Quick test fit to make sure the perspex would go in neatly. Then I'll pull it apart again for painting. I'm running low on workshop blue, but enough to finish this project. And then did one final assembly, screwing it back together once the paint had dried. I'd like to give a massive thanks to Tim from Turgworks who put the uh, scrap wood build off on again this year and this is my entry to that challenge. Go and check it out on his Instagram. I really enjoyed the process of turning this digital sketch up into reality and I enjoyed using the Fit Finder from Microjig supplied to me by Timbercon. Thanks guys for that too. It will be a handy addition to the workspace. I hope you guys enjoyed this project and I will see you on the next one. 2022 was a big year because finally SawStop released a baby sized table saw and I could add one to my workshop. But this video isn't about that. This, this video's strange.
Check square, check square, carry on.
not sure what I was smoking that day. And finally it's time to go full YouTuber as I round out my small workshop build, not with another piece of furniture, not with a tool, but with a wall built entirely of all the scraps and offcuts that I'd generated over the past five years. So recently I picked up this plywood packing box. It's taking up space and the wall at the back of my workshop looks terrible. What to do with it? Here's the challenge. Build something you could not have made five years ago, uh, film the product, the process, upload it to YouTube, uh, and use the hashtag five years ago challenge. Well, Phil, I think I've got pretty much exactly five years worth of offcuts in my shop. So if I combine those along with this uh, lovely pallet box, I think we can do something about that. Right, so of course it's 1.1 meters across and the widest board that I have from that pallet hall is 900 mil. So we're gonna have to get creative and cut these up. You're not gonna see them anyway, so I'm gonna literally pick the worst of the six mil, make a frame out of all of the slats. Again, they're the longest bits that I've got and see what we can make it do here with a bit of pocket hole joinery. So a few seconds of detailed measurements, turning that into plans and that's the sort of pocket holy goodness that we're going to go with. I have used nearly everything. That's all that's going to be left over from those pallets that I just picked up. Uh, we've got the 1100s for the four crosses and then three different sizes at 850-ish, 750-ish and 550 plus to make up the middle gap. So I'll trim these ones down.
this here is my awesome clamping bench, which of course excels when doing pocket hole joinery. But I still hadn't picked up the kind of big error that I had made, and we were just pushing along. Everything seemed fine. I'll link some plans below that you can actually build this bench if you like it. If you do a lot of pocket hole joinery, it is fantastic. Alright, press on. I'll catch up my error soon. Well, fixers, let's take a second to talk about complacency. I am obviously a big fan of pocket holes and Craig Australia have helped me out a lot. And so I want to make sure I share with you when I feck up so that you don't have to. This is not 19 mil three quarter stock. I know that the pallet wood has varying thickness and quite frankly, I just didn't measure it properly. I assumed it was three quarter. It's more like an inch. And I was wondering why my pocket hole joints have that much flex in them because honestly, they are usually pretty rock solid. Look, you're not going to build a bridge with them, but for this sort of stuff, they should be good. And I was just not happy with that. I broke one of the joints apart on purpose, and this is why. My screws are only coming through a few mil. They should be coming through about this much down here. And I was wondering, what the hell is going on? Until I measured the thickness of my boards, I set this drill bit for 19 mil, which means it hasn't gone deep enough to allow the screws to go through. The fact this is holding together is actually quite frankly a miracle. So now I can either go through and swap all of the screws for these larger two inch screws, which seem to work, or I can re-drill all the pocket holes to the correct depth. I think I'm just gonna swap the screws. No matter how many times you do something, people, check, check, check. This time it's just cost me time but in other situations, your whole project could fall over if you've not assembled it correctly. Let's get back to it. That's much better. Let's look at the two joints. This one's still got the short screws in it. This one's now got the long screws. They're all gonna have to go. Dunsky. Good thing too, run out of screws. That's much more solid. Now, just in case, I wanted this wall to be removable. It's honestly not going to have too much weight, and it's going to be sitting pretty much on the ground. So, three screws are going to hold it together. I have brick, and that poses its own challenges, but at least means I can screw them in anywhere. Now, just to make sure those screws are always accessible.
Fingers. Isn't that wall meant to be for the off cuts only challenge? Fair dinkum. Now the wall's done, it's time to go on a scrap hunt and this is where we're going to be starting. I'm going to after mostly solid timber, so I'm going to try not to use any plywood, but this box is full of random scraps. That box under there with the stickers on is full of random scraps. Over here, most of this stuff I'm probably going to keep, but there are some smaller pieces which I will cut up because they're too little to be doing anything useful with. I want to dock off the ends of these massive red gum railway sleepers because they now need to live here and they currently don't fit under that pipe. So I'll better get some scrap offcuts by cutting those down just a little bit shorter until I figure out what the hell I'm gonna build with them. Pile of scraps in the corner there, another pile of scraps in the corner here, scraps underneath here, and in that box, more scraps. Let's get chopping using a variety of tools and make buckets of scrap wood. And just when you think you're done, more offcuts. Oh dear. At least I should have enough. Yeah, it's me old drum sander. Okie dokie, that is all of the usable pine re-sawn into this terrible mess. Yeah, the next video is going to be hooking up the uh, dust extractor, because that's just ridiculous. Uh, here are the bits that I've got. So most of this pine in Oregon, because it was soft enough, I've re-sawn it down to about 12 mil, and that'll just make my life a little bit easier. Got me a bit extra stock. What do you do with the offcuts of the offcuts, though? I don't know if they'll make it onto the wall. They're all like super thin or short or otherwise manky. Uh, they might be good for plugging gaps. Now I'm gonna move on to the hard light colored woods. That is my Tassie Oak. These are all from Common Wood Co, by the way. Uh, great little furniture maker in Sydney. Oh yeah. We've hit the offcut payload. Thanks, Pete. And then I've got the darker colored woods, which again, I will try and leave at their nominal 19 mil thickness because I am not resawing bloody spotted gum. This stuff is murder on the tools. I'm going to be lucky to be able to cut it in half, let alone get it any thinner. All right. Next step, the fun part. Tacka, 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 tacka. But first, I've got a lot more cutting to do for you. It'll be in a few seconds. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is definitely time to hook up the dust extractor. The CTS did brilliantly today, even through the red gum. Taking it slowly, it has generated a pile of beautiful sawdust, which I now have to clean up. It is definitely time for the next project to be the dust collector. Uh, speaking of Carpetech, this here is available from them, and so far I've been running it for nearly a year now, and it hasn't let me down. Yes, she is a little bit expensive, but if you look at my video on that, you'll see why I chose it rather than some of its competitors on the market. Yeah, yep, filming life, scrap wood life. Let's grab the nail gun and hey presto, this stuff up.
you get the picture. It's gonna take a while. I'll just take some photos every hundred pieces <laughs> and we'll do some sort of montage because I can't film all this. It'll take way too long. So this particular time lapse I set for exactly one hour. And if you watch closely, you'll see how little I got done in that time. I think the whole wall took somewhere between four and five hours all up of cutting, measuring and fitting the scrap, trying to leave as few gaps as possible, which I would then have to come back and plug later. Luckily, I got a little help. Okay, if you call chiming in, sticking one piece to the wall, graffitiing it and walking away help, love you wifey. Okie dokie, I think that is all the filling of gaps that I can be bothered to do. It looks pretty good. It is scrap wood, it was all completely random bits of crap. So there are going to be holes, but that's why I use the uh, nice plywood in behind, so that it forms part of the wall too. Do I sand it at all? Let's see! Jeebus, that was a lot of work, but it was oh so much fun. One of the best experiences I've had in the workshop recently. And also let me secretly tease the impending arrival of my baby girl, who joined us about two or three weeks later. Right, let's put a cherry on top of this sawdust cake and bring it all home with the last embellishment, a CNC LED lit logo. So last week I used almost every single offcut that I generated over the past five years to build a feature wall in the back of the workshop. However, it wasn't done yet as I wanted to display my logo. Just like I designed here in SketchUp. Initially, I was going to do this by hand, but then I thought, hey, I know Mario the Woodfather, and he has a brand new CNC from Bluecarb which he is itching to try out, so he could do a much better job than I could. And I'll let the machines take over for the first time in the Fixer Fingers workshop to cut out all of the fiddly bits. Mm -hmm. 
and that would have made a really quick project. I thought Mario was just going to make me a logo. Instead, this is what arrived in the mail. Some assembly required. What? I already cut the damn thing out for you. You want me to sand and paint it as well? Alrighty, so we had to put it together and paint it and sand it ourselves. How hard could that be? At least the fiddly bits were done. This workshop sign would be based on my little membership coins. I was going to use the workshop blue paint that I have all over the place, the trademark red of the Fix-It Fingers logo, and try to replicate that coin as closely as possible, complete with cliché saw blade. But there was one bit Mario didn't send me, and that was the background circle. I've never had to cut one before, so I don't have a fancy jig of any description, and I didn't really feel like making one. So we knocked out the crudest circle cutting jig for the router that I possibly could. The Craig Rip Cut actually makes an excellent measuring square for this sort of thing. This was a bit of 9mm MDF and fortunately I'd already kind of painted it blue when I was doing testing for the feature wall in our bedroom. The jig worked well, but um, yeah that's a lot of dust. Let's hook up the vacuum. which we then have to move every 5 seconds to stop it from fouling the jig. But at least it was a lot cleaner. Then I got clever. Put the vacuum on the jig. That works. End result, one nice circle, and don't worry about that old hole, it'll come in useful to hang the thing up later. Use all the scraps. Honestly, Mario did an awesome job for me. Already stuck these two bits together and it only required a little bit of sanding to get it ready for assembly. The letters in particular I was dreading making and so having the CNC do them for me, ugh, magic. Running out of workshop blue, I only wanted to paint the sections that I needed to. And I thought I might as well try to strip some of the paint off from the middle, but it just clogged up my sandpaper straight away. So I decided to break out my AccuBurk. I've never handled a card scraper before, so forgive the shocking technique. This one was sent out to me by my good friends at Carbotech to try out. And I thought it might help me get off these three or four layers of paint. First I attempted to give it a sharpen. And got some okay results. But honestly, it just kind of made it really super smooth. There was a lot of paint on this board, so eventually I just gave up. But it was good practice. I'll read the instructions and watch the videos on how to do this properly before I use it on the next project. But it was fun to give this a try. And I did get one or two nice shavings. With all the pieces prepped, it was time to get the workshop into painting mode. First up was the last of my supply of workshop blue to do the outer edge of the back circle. I had to mix up some custom grey for the hand 
and I did actually undercoat the saw blade so that the red craft paint would stand out. This was a mistake, that stuff sucked. I think I put five or six coats of it on, used basically the whole tube. I'm glad it's gone, next time I'll just buy spray paint. Because it made the letters take a few seconds. The only tricky bit of this process was masking off the giant fix-it fingers hand in order to spray the outer boundary the same jet black. And to give me an excuse to weed it all out, which is super fun. I was very glad that Mario sent me the letters still within the outer borders from their carving because this allowed me to do a few things like space out the position of my logo. Honestly, I don't know why I didn't assemble this with Presto the Nail Gun before I painted it. That would have been good, but ultimately it worked just as well. Double check with the letter spaces to ensure that everything would line up nice weighed it down after putting on some polyurethane glue and left that overnight to dry. And uh, fill in the little gaps with some wood putty and then paint them over them. You'll never see them from a distance. Now, of course, this is not a new idea. I stole it firstly off the Mad Viking Jesper makes, but unlike him, I don't want power cables hanging down the bottom. So instead, I decided to copy Fat Hog Woodworking, who was clever enough to hide his cable behind his pallet wall. Yeah, I missed that step. So it looks like I'm gonna have to go with battery power to light this baby up. P.S. One of those channels has a couple of hundred thousand subscribers, one has a couple of hundred subscribers. I highly encourage you to check out Small Makers. We were all there once, some of us will stay there forever. Doesn't mean their contact is any crap, nothing against Jesper's awesome stuff, but Fat Hog does have some cool things. Go and check him out. To attach the red blade to the blue circle, I needed to very carefully measure out where those support locks were so I could screw into them from behind. A bit of scrap to evenly space things. Clamp, flip, drill, drive, and hope for the best. Time to put the fix it in fix it fingers, and again the little offcuts came in super handy. As did a pair of tweezers. Keep those on hand in the shop if you don't already. Great for fiddly bits. With it all together, a quick coat of clear poly seals the deal. And now we can attach our generic LED strips. That was easy and pretty exciting. Let's see how it looks. But first we need to get it on the bloody wall.
Ready for the big reveal? Ta-da! Yeah, that's that's pr pretty crap. The, um, battery power, not great. But then I had an idea. If we point them outwards instead of towards the back of the saw blade, maybe it'll look a little better. Here's take two. An improvement, and I'll take it not to run a power cord. Lovely. And here you go guys, my new studio space. Complete with backdrop signs and all the rest. When I need to do my talky videos, I now have a much prettier backdrop from which to stand in front of. This is James from Fix It Fingers. I hope you enjoyed this CNC escapade and I'll catch you on the next one. Thanks Mario, your turn now. And I do hope to catch you on the next one because if you've made it all the way through to the end of this Fix It Fingers workshop marathon, you're my kind of people. Even if you only had it on in the background or fell asleep. Wake up, Jesper. There are thousands of workshops out there, but none of them are quite like yours, and everyone's journey is going to be different. But this one was mine. The reason you got to see it was because of this bloke. If you hadn't picked it up already, this was forced upon me, slightly, or just politely encouraged by those two legends of fellas, Jesper Makes and Mark from Dana Maid. If you're into this long form format, then please, please, please go and watch their two videos, which were the absolute inspiration for what I've done here today. And remember, be excellent to each other and steal all of your friends' best ideas. Good night, Jesper. Good night, Mark.